Good afternoon, everyone. You are watching the special lunch and dialogue envisioning China, Africa's trade and investment at the China Africa Conference LSE 2021. My name is Shirley Yu, director of the China Africa Initiative at the LSE. And joining us today are some of the world's most authoritative and leading minds on Africa and the global development. We are greatly honored to welcome Her Excellency, Dr. Rania al Mashart, Minister of International Cooperation, Egypt. She's one of the most powerful women on the global stage and indeed an inspiration for females all around the world. And we also have the senior leadership from uh, our leading global development institutions joining us. We have uh, Jing Donghua, Vice President and Treasurer of the World Bank, Leslie Mastrop, CFO of the New Development Bank, who is uh, just waiting to check in here, Dr. Martin Kimmich, Chief Risk Officer of Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. And so before we get started, we just would like to welcome invite you to please write your comments and questions on our social media platforms and by watching our distinguished speakers. So first of all, I would love to start with a question for you, Your Excellency. You did mention on CNBC a couple of weeks ago that multilateralism is arrived and thriving. Now today our lineup of speakers absolutely represent that spirit of global multilateralism. But in 2021, Things seem to have changed a bit. The understanding of globalization has uh, shifted. And so is multilateralism today in 2021 still taking on the same characteristics as before? Are there any new architectures on the horizon that we are looking at? Thank you very much, uh, Shirley, and thank you for your kind uh, introduction. Um, as I was mentioning uh, earlier, uh, at the beginning of 2020, uh, we entered the pandemic with protectionism, a trade war, uh, the geopolitics uh, changing, uh, and then all of us were hit uh, with a pandemic uh, that initially uh, sort of uh, created a rhetoric that every country is on its own, no exports, the supply chains being cut off. But very soon after, uh, everybody realized that to get out of this uh, global problem, we had to work together. So in my view, uh, no, there is scope and space for multilateralism. It's inevitable, uh, notwithstanding the challenges that we face, particularly given uh, the uh, you know, very fastly evolving uh, uh, geopolitical uh, uh, developments that are taking place. Nonetheless, uh, when we talk about uh, different countries having uh, national agendas towards 2030, uh, they are able to fulfill this with a lot of cooperation with multilateral institutions as well as with bilateral development partners. Uh, in our case, this has continued in 2020 and through 2021 uh, in a very robust uh, manner. Uh, and that, that's what gives me confidence that, uh, uh, no, there is multilateralism. We work together. Uh, we have... Uh, whether it's inclusive, digital, or green uh, as, uh, as national strategies, uh, every country that's able to fulfill this in collaboration with its development partners adds to the global agenda. Right. Very interestingly, uh, uh, Dr. Rania, you mentioned about uh, achieving the sustainable development goals. Uh, every country, rich or poor, are in this goal together, and we are nine years away to achieving those uh, state goals. Uh, what currently represent the biggest challenges in Africa? Uh, of course, uh, when we take a look at, uh, uh, at Africa, uh, the uh, infrastructure uh, is an issue. Infrastructure related to digital. Today, everything that is uh, taking place and the pandemic has shown us uh, how uh, countries are resilient depending on or a function of their readiness uh, on the digital platforms. So I think that is uh, a, very, uh, a very key uh, uh, challenge. Uh, the other is, uh, uh, of course, the, the younger population, and that younger population needs uh, more jobs uh, and therefore a more private sector engagement. Uh, so these are, um, and private sector engagement comes through different types of financing, whether it's trade financing or, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, ODA financing, which comes at low cost, uh, but uh, readdressing uh, the risk premium. Uh, for many of the countries in Africa, it might be uh, one venue uh, where we can all coordinate on, particularly given uh, the potential of the continent and how it can provide uh, a lot uh, of uh, value added to the global community.
Mm. And Jing Dong, uh, you earlier mentioned that uh, it's very important uh, for Africa's sustainability to essentially create a vibrant private sector in Africa. So you are very passionate about uh, uh, working in and around Africa's development for the past uh, three plus decades. So what are the things that the World Bank, as well as other multilateral institutions, are doing today with African governments to ensure uh, job creations, uh, the private sector generation, and the delivering the transparency of uh, the corporate governance to ensure the corporate sector's sustainability. Well, thank you, Shirley, uh, and certainly delighted to be on the same panel with Honorable Minister and my colleagues from uh, AIIB and New Development Bank. So maybe just before I answer that question, uh, we are still in the middle of a global pandemic, which itself is an indication that without multilateralism, you know, each individual country would, would be absolutely in despair in terms of overcoming, you know, the, the global effort of callbacks, the sharing of vaccines so that we can accelerate uh, uh, access to vaccines so that the world can get out of this is, is certainly a great uh, uh, effort uh, and, and true demonstration of value of multilateralism. When it comes to Africa, uh, there, there are quite a number of things in terms of how do we make sure that Africa is attractive to private investors, both within the continent, but also from, uh, from abroad. Now, I used to be at IFC, and so is uh, uh, my good friend, uh, Dr. Kimmich. Uh, but now I'm at the World Bank side. I very much appreciate the policy advice the World Bank uh, has been working on with governments in terms of creating that enabling environment. And since the honorable uh, uh, minister is here, one great project we did together, and certainly IAB was involved, is the Egyptian solar project, where through the partnership between the World Bank, MIGA, ISC, AIB, and many uh, 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 private banks, instead of a piecemeal building of renewable energy, one solar farm to another solar farm, Instead, I think we work with the, the government and certainly minister played a key role in figuring out how do we tell private investors this is a holistic plan of renewable energy for Egypt. Here is a power purchase agreement that is transparent, that is backed up not only by the government, but by MIGA, by the World Bank, and then private sector sponsors could come pick and choose which solar farm they'd like to work on. That was very successful. And if my memory serves me correct, I think there was 13 solar farms parceled out to a number of private sector sponsors who came in and pick and choose their own. And certainly many commercial banks and AI, BISC came in a syndicated loan platform. So, you know, financing was solved. So I think getting private sector interested certainly needs a multi-stakeholder participation, starting with the government, giving private sector the, the level of confidence, not through words, but through actual policy, through a level of transparency, and certainly Egypt has done, uh, done it really well. Mm. So talking about uh, this uh, cross-continental multilateral cooperation, particularly in Egypt, is uh, really coincidental. And we have almost every uh, spokesperson on this project here. But Dr. Uh, Kimmich, you are sitting in Beijing. You, you are, are you are in senior in this new leadership of one of uh, um, the fastest the rising global multilateral development institutions. I understand that, that just recently your uh, institution has come up with the policy that uh, AIIB is no longer going to invest in fossil fuel projects overseas. And I think a lot of these uh, major policies are going to inevitably transform the African sustainable landscape. So from your perspective, in uh, Africa's development, are you doing something different, maybe slightly innovative, but a little bit uh, different from what the, uh, say, for example, your counterparts uh, have been doing in Africa? Uh, first, thanks uh, to be on this panel and hello to Her Excellency. She might not remember it, but I met her at the World Bank meeting in 2019. <laughs> and obviously, hello to Ching Dong and, and Leslie. Um, 
so yes, uh, when we started our energy strategy, uh, we started already with a very restrictive use of coal, only in absolute uh, uh, exceptional circumstances when there's no other energy source available. But however, uh, 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 earlier this year, we made the public commitment, we will not finance coal. And uh, this is in advance of our new uh, 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 reviewed uh, uh, energy policy. Uh, Next question is obviously uh, uh, gas, still uh, a carbon, a source of, of uh, energy. Uh, we see gas as transitionary and, and also uh, obviously have criteria where gas is still useful. Also, as we have committed, like uh, the World Bank, IFC has, uh, I'm sure, and the NDB will or has uh, to be Paris aligned uh, by July 1st, 2023. Uh, uh, also, there will be uh, further restrictions on the use of gas. But real focus is obviously be catalytic, be catalytic uh, with respect to the, the real green energies. And that is obviously, and uh, I wanted to stress that Paris alignment, uh, achieving the Paris goals can only mean being multilateral and cooperative. And despite all the geopolitical tensions, you know, which, which have arisen, uh, also over the last two years, I, I think the sensitivity to, 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 to the climate change risks, which are particularly severe in Africa, uh, uh, have become, uh, uh, I think, made headlines everywhere, whether it's government or even pri private sectors, which seem to lead governments in, in many countries. So I'm very optimistic that this is a big area of cooperation. And the project that uh, Ching Dong mentioned uh, has taken years in preparation, needed a policy reform to start with, and there was personal involvement of, of, of Her Excellency that is going to that this is going to be delivered, and this indeed was a big success. So we have 103 members today. We have an increasing member uh, membership in Africa. Uh, Egypt is one of our founding members, and uh, so we obviously have a have a fast growing investment program in Egypt. And uh, climate climate mitigation is a key center stage of what we do, and uh, obviously. In the short term, also, we are focusing on crisis response. But going forward, it is one of our stated objectives in Africa, because we do believe that the consequences of climate change in Africa are particularly se severe. And if you look at who participated in the DSSI out in Africa, it's 48 countries out of 73. While, you know, objectively, debt levels as a percentage of GDP might not be very high, but the ability to endure uh, uh, setbacks uh, is, is very, very limited because of a very, very small revenue base. Thank you. So the risk is high as well. So Leslie, you talking about uh, sustainability, you are passionate about it. I'm sorry because of the Wi-Fi issue. We seem to have missed uh, some of your incredible remarks there. Uh, but uh, at New Development Bank, it's really interesting when the people, especially our students, uh, when they hear about New Development Bank, they just think it's something new. But it actually came from your predecessor is the BRICS Bank, which was originally uh, the BRICS uh, countries uh, partnership in uh, building this uh, multilateral platform. But you have gone way beyond that original BRICS conception, right? So tell us about your ambitions, particularly in Africa, please. Leslie, you're on mute. <laughs> the bank was created in 20... Can you hear me now? The bank was created in 2015. The articles were signed in 2014. At that stage, as you know, there was a growing sentiment amongst the large emerging uh, markets that their voice was not adequately uh, represented in the existing Bretton Woods institution. So uh, let's be very clear. There was a feeling within the large uh, market, especially within the G20, uh, they used G20 to a degree to try and, and effect those reforms, but it took a very long time. So these institutions were created. New Development Bank was set up by the Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, but the intention has always been to create a new emerging markets focused uh, multilateral uh, institution. So we um, will now migrate beyond the BRICS countries. We have already started uh, in that regard. The bank has just admitted uh, three new members and the process of admitting new members will now gather momentum. Uh, we hope and, and are very 
confident that a number of countries from the African uh, uh, continent will also be joining, and so also Central Asia, uh, Latin America, uh, and so on. So over time, the bank will become a truly uh, global uh, uh, institution. But as I was saying earlier on, there are very unique challenges facing the world uh, right now. And we see ourselves uh, uh, playing a much bigger role in what we would broadly define as the just transition. And by the way, this language is captured in the Paris Agreement on Climate Change, where it was recognized that there will be winners and losers in this uh, transitions. There are many emerging markets. In fact, let's take Africa. We're talking about energy here. Uh, almost half a billion people in Africa still do not have access to electricity. So forget about the coal debate and the issues around climate change and the concerns about you know the uh, global temperatures rising above 2%. We're talking here about you know, day-to-day uh, -day issues of having access to uh, a, an important resource like, like, like power. Kids cannot study, hospitals cannot function. So as, as Martin was saying now, we have to make sure that the provision of power is a central objective in uh, the uh, continent. Obviously, there's a lot of large uh, supplies of cheap coal in many uh, countries. How we deal with that is a challenge that multilateral banks have to play a central and leading role uh, in. It's not going to happen magically that all of these coal-fired power stations, let's take South Africa, where I'm from, one province have probably about 70% of the coal-fired power stations called Pumalanga in South Africa. So all of those jobs in the coal mines, uh, all of the, the, the value chains, those uh, um, uh, towns, like the deindustrialized towns of the developed uh, world uh, 30, 40 years ago, will become stranded and will have massive issues. So I guess what I'm saying is that we have to tilt our focus to ensure that we deal with uh, what is called the just transition and we provide the transition finance to ensure that, that workers are retrained, that uh, uh, those stranded assets are, are not just left unattended, but that there is a process of readjustment. Mm. Very interestingly, I know uh, Jindo mentioned earlier in our fireside chat that the world uh, may perhaps uh, uh, does not really fully appreciate the scale of Africa's uh, geography. So essentially, uh, Jindo described that if we just drop uh, the United States, Canada, and China all in Africa, Africa continents would still be bigger than the three combined. And so now talking about the infrastructure, that's absolutely massive uh, in order to cover that entire continental development there. So one African leader recently, uh, Her Excellency Ruth Kagia, the Deputy Chief of Staff for the President of Kenya, she had a she had a great thought. She said, one thing I would love to recommend to China is actually to go beyond country-specific approach, to take a continental approach in looking at Africa. And infrastructure has to be interregional, isn't it? Are we moving to stage where instead of working with countries, uh, sovereign centers, uh, we are essentially looking at Africa continental development as a whole with a unified approach? Any, any thoughts there, Jingdong, at the World Bank? I know that you probably, there is no bigger authority on China, Africa than you, you are. Well, look, I'm, I'm the treasurer of the World Bank, so I don't work on the operational side. But that said, uh, Shirley, I think one thing that we, we, uh, we, we, we are very excited about is the new digital infrastructure. How could it help Africa to leapfrog, right? For example, access to schooling uh, during pandemic, and that exposed the inequality between OECD countries and many countries that, 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 that don't have Wi-Fi access. And that also has great implication for financial inclusion, for access to finance, so on and so forth. For traditional uh, uh, infrastructure, and definitely I think China's uh, example of building roads um, and not only analyzing the feasibility purely based on the road itself, but the potential positive uh, network effect, right? For commerce, for manufacturing, for logistics, for supply chain, uh, to factor in the broader benefit. I think that could change the economic analysis of whether building infrastructure makes sense or not. Uh, uh, last point I want to make uh, is that Definitely. I think when you compare China with Africa, probably the provinces of China 
in size uh, similar to many of the countries uh, in Africa. And certainly highways cannot stop at provincial borders. And many of the poorest provinces in China, like Yunnan, Guizhou, once they were, uh, 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 you know, developing and, and developing very fast infrastructures, then new engines of economic growth came about. From tourism to exotic fruits that only those regions could, could, uh, um, could produce, to, to other agricultural products, uh, and, and therefore it actually uh, uh, really triggered new engines of, uh, of, uh, of uh, excess. Uh, for example, I'll give you one example. In Mauritania, camel milk is something that is quite famous. But I think because of logistic restrictions, that camel milk actually cannot be you know, exported because of the short period once you, you know, when you don't have cold storage, most of them just go bad. So just imagine if you do have infrastructure built around it, whether it's logistics, cold storage, transportation, uh, that could be you know, a new source of uh, revenue and new source of private sector investment uh, for, for, for the country. But let me just stop there. Mm, so therefore, the network effect is very interesting. So earlier this morning, we had uh, um, representatives uh, for the president of uh, the African Development Bank at our opening session. And so indeed, it was truly inspirational in the speech, uh, uh, the, uh, the African uh, Development Bank's representative talked about uh, if China could move from a low income country to a higher middle income country within one generation, then Africa certainly can too. So um, it's very, very, I, we see uh, really truly a very ambitious agenda on the horizon there. So uh, your excellency, what are some of uh, the, the um, fundamental prerequisites you think Africa needs in order to achieve that sort of grand agenda? Uh, well, uh, let me uh, say a few things in the Egyptian context and then the continent or in the continent. Um, uh, the, the example of Bin Ban solar panel was mentioned. How did that come about? There was uh, a structural reform introduced by the government, the feed-in tariff. So there was a realization that in order to open the potential for a sector, we need to do, do a certain regulatory reform, which we did take into account. Once that took place, you were able to mobilize uh, multilateralism uh, in the sense that you had the different uh, multilateral uh, uh, development banks there, you had the private sector. So this is an example. If any country uh, is uh, uh, focused enough uh, knowing where it needs to push, I believe that uh, that opens the doors. Seriousness, clarity, follow-up, uh, and transparently mentioning what you're doing. So these are these are things that we have uh, been able to do on a national uh, uh, stage, and this has helped us uh, tremendously. Sorry about that noise. Um, uh, uh, the, so in our case, for example, the uh, official development assistance uh, portfolio is $25 billion across various sectors. So uh, this is an example. When we talk about African Development Bank and in Africa infrastructure, we have the Cairo Cape Town uh, Road, for instance, is one of the projects uh, that uh, we are uh, uh, endorsing and it's being done with the African Development Bank. Uh, electricity transmission between uh, 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 Cairo, Southern Sudan uh, and in Libya, that's another example. So there are these um, uh, items which are very important when it comes to collaboration within the continent and uh, IFIs or MDBs are there uh, to lend support once the project uh, is, uh, uh, is, is clear. Uh, the African Continental Free Trade Agreement is a very important mechanism. We need to, uh, uh, you know, create more actions towards it so that we can fulfill its potential. We have a 2063 Africa uh, agenda. So there's the 2030 global and then there's the, tw the Africa 2063. And of course, the um, uh, Silk uh, uh, Road uh, is another uh, very important initiative uh, uh, the Belt, uh, uh, the Belton uh, Road, which is very, very important, and it also ties in uh, with the uh, Africa uh, 2063 agenda. So, so there are several uh, items uh, which, if we uh, start activating a little bit more, uh, we will be able to answer many of the questions 
uh, that uh, that you mentioned. So there's so much that can be do done. Uh, it you know it's impossible to do a big bang approach, but there are you know if we push on each of these venues, uh, there is a great potential that can be realized. So what are some of the structural uh, weaknesses or uh, maybe potential for opportunities that you believe that Africa um, needs to resolve collectively? So some fundamental characterizations of the, uh, the of the uh, continent and the economy that uh, must be um, collectively yes. so I guess uh, yeah, one of the or improved upon. So one of the one of the key uh, uh, challenges for the world is water. And uh, uh, water is an issue uh, uh, because of climate change, because of population growth. Uh, and therefore, uh, there are several uh, uh, wastewater management plans that we have uh, done. Uh, and many of our private sector companies who implemented those are doing the same in other African countries. So uh, what is important here is uh, because lending to certain African countries has a risk premium, uh, uh, we need to discuss with uh, different uh, uh, development banks uh, how we can bring that down, given the successes that we've seen uh, with certain private sector from the country to be scaled up and replicated in others. Looks I think like we've, we've lost, lost early. We've, we've lost early there for a uh, moment, but I wanted to add uh, one or two things that I think are really sort of uh, critical. Uh, for Africa going uh, forward. You, you, you touched on some of the uh, fundamentals. I mean, uh, the people often ask whether it is possible to replicate the, you know, 40 years of spectacular reform and opening up and this uh, growth miracle that, that China unleashed over the last 40 years. Could that be replicated in, um, in, in Africa? I've lived in China now for the last uh, six and a half years, and I've often thought about this issue and people you know, often wonder what are the lessons that one can take from this uh, experience. And as, as the His Ex uh, Excellency has just sort of outlined, there, is no, there are no silver bullets. I mean, obviously, we have to do the basics which is, you know, strengthen the uh, fundamentals that underpin growth, which is investment in people. Uh, ultimately, development is about uh, human capital and building strong institutions. You know, or, you know, there's things like building a regulatory framework and investment friendly ease of doing business. All of the, those things matter. But ultimately, as Jingdong uh, outlined at the beginning, uh, it's really about uh, sustainable development. It's about developing people, human capacity and developing institutions. So. That is a long-term endeavor. We cannot have, you know, elements of a, a sort of five or a ten year sort of strategy, hoping that we can replicate what China has uh, done. I mean, obviously, in the context of the fact that we have multiple countries, we have to look at what is the one or two unique features that all of us share. And the one really most valuable asset that we have are our people. We have the youngest population. We will have the biggest uh, working age population uh, by 2034 in the world. Uh, China, so Africa, as you know, will be the size of China and India combined by, by 2050. In the context of an aging world, this is a most valuable asset. So investment in human capital is at the heart of a, uh, a rejuvenation uh, strategy for, for Africa, in, in my view. Mm. So, uh, Leslie, you earlier mentioned uh, the, the mission of the NDB is essentially to create a multilateral development bank more for the emerging world. I'd love to come back to that point and specifically invite you to address what are some of the, how does that imply about the principles and the, 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 the execution of the new development bank today that are uh, uh, slightly perhaps different from the standard understanding of multilateral development? How do you address that new emerging world need? I mean, I'd say the, the, the bank in every respect represents, as I said earlier on, the sort of core architecture of what the other multilateral banks uh, have. However, as I, as I outlined uh, earlier on, there are unique uh, sort of aspirations and there are unique features of developing countries and emerging markets, which has to be taken into account. So the way the ownership structure works of the bank, 80% of the, of the equity of the new development bank will always be held by emerging markets. So we will have non-borrowing members and we hope we will get non-borrowing members in very soon. 
because uh, we already have one, which is United Arab Emirates, but we hope to get significantly more uh, developing uh, developed countries in because these are highly rated countries. They bring very unique additional strengths to the institution. So uh, we're not saying that we're building a exclusive borrowers club because that is not the uh, uh, intent. However, as I mentioned earlier on, we do want to see what new can we do Jim Dong spoke about the power of technology earlier on. There's an untapped potential in terms of the power of uh, uh, technology. Secondly, as I mentioned, we have unique aspects linked to the uh, transition to low carbon future uh, and this uh, desire to find a, a set of strategies to deal with uh, the transitional implications of this move from you know carbon intensive world towards a low carbon future. We would like to help our countries in that transition journey because it's a unique uh, set of uh, challenges that the African countries will be uh, facing. Absolutely interesting. Uh, Jing Dong is obviously a, a big uh, believer in innovation. And so I believe is uh, uh, Dr. Kimmich at the AIIB. So from your uh, two gentlemen's perspective, Africa earlier this morning, uh, our, our African representatives were talking about uh, essentially uh, Africa seeing this uh, digital transformation as a major global leveling off opportunity for Africa with the developed world in this fourth industrial revolution. And so I believe there were language such as uh, Africa will take a lead or a leadership role in the fourth industrial revolution. Um, so from AIIB and particularly the World Bank's uh, perspectives, how are we supporting the uh, African ambition there in its digital transformation? Dr. Kim, please. Okay, I can go first. I, uh, I can go, go first. Uh, obviously, uh, uh, in the field of infrastructure, uh, uh, digital innovation is playing a major role. Uh, for example, when you look at smart grid systems, you look at smart cities, you look at smart tra transport systems, uh, where the digital tra transformation does allow you, and Jin Dong used the term earlier, to leapfrog. Uh, there is an advantage. I don't want to sound arrogant, uh, uh, but there is to, to that extent also an advantage not having any baggage in terms of old infrastructure uh, uh, that you have to use uh, because you're going to accept some costs. Uh, and to, to look at the new wave uh, that, is, that is feasible and, 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 fi and financeable. Um, but I still want to maybe go link a little back to the question earlier. And, and it doesn't sound very mundane, but implementation capacity execution is is absolutely essential uh, in in delivering success of projects and obviously one of the major differences is is if you're in china uh, it's its execution capabilities and and obviously also in in egypt uh, uh, you know this is a this is a very uh, advanced uh, uh, civil society uh, with tremendous execution ca capabilities and that is a challenge in, in some countries. So that's where we lean a lot on the World Bank. We co-finance about a third of all our investments with the World Bank because the World Bank has local implementation execution cap capabilities that are important to get the del deliveries uh, on ground. Uh, whether it's digital or not digital, we, we did digital recently in Rwanda with the World Bank uh, uh, to help those small companies to get access. Uh, to the outside world. Uh, we have learned all from uh, Impesa, which I believe now is already 15 years ago, uh, which completely leapfrogged uh, the banking system. And I think the same thing we're going to see uh, in, in logistics and in other areas. Healthcare is a big area where, 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 where the digital revolution will be a major impact and obviously uh, uh, education. So I'm, I'm very optimistic. Uh, we also have challenges around digital. That's not, I'm a risk officer. Uh, we we have a risk of facing a digital divide. And, and I think as, as development partners, we have to collaboratively work uh, uh, against that and, and to have common standards uh, also with respect to digital, with respect to data privacy, uh, that, that does allow us to, to uh, collaborate uh, effectively. Mm. Jindu, you have uh, you have been working really uh, passionately on the digital transformation. Particularly, you talk quite a lot about Rwanda. So, what are some of the innovative uh, initiatives that we are doing in jumpstarting Africa's uh, digital transformation there? 
Yes, surely. I think uh, colleagues have talked about the, the importance of digital uh, quite enough, and, and certainly that would link to uh, making sure that human capital in Africa gets proper education and they become productive labor forces. Uh, and of course, the experience of Kenya is very, very telling that no matter what is a stage of development, right, if you somehow uh, 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 can make digital access happen, you know, in Kenya, access to finance is now over 90 percent of the population, one of the highest even in the world. So how do we make sure that we nurture, support similar uh, successes and similar to the Egyptian solar? It is a whole value chain from regulatory reform on government policy all the way to having private sector entrepreneurship come into, uh, uh, come into uh, specific solutions to each part of whether it's remittance, whether it's online bank banking, whether it's investment. You know, the fact that Kenya Treasury issues the world's first online savings bond. So Kenyan citizens can buy those bonds through cell phone. And this is really the first. So which leads to another story that is, we, how do we make sure that we nurture successes within Africa that will serve mo Earth's motivations? You know, I, I want to share that um, Egypt issued one of the earliest green bond on the continent, 750 million, five times oversubscribed. And congratulations, Honorable Minister, that's a great success, right? That is, in addition to ODA support, how do we open Africa so they become attractive? to international uh, institutional investors. Uh, so I think it's, it's really a multitude of, uh, of efforts that we have to make. But one thing I wanted to say is that, you know, because we're talking about China, Africa, and, and China certainly had exceptional growth, but just want, want to remind your audience that over the past 20 years, in aggregate, Africa was also making rapid progress. Just cite some numbers so that we put things in perspective. The access to electricity 20 years ago was about 26%. Now it's about half of the population. Still a long way to go, but that's good progress. Life expectancy mm -hmm. went up 10 years. Primary education completion went from 54% to 69%. And, and per capita GDP uh, 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 income went from $550 to $15,000, tripling over the past uh, uh, 20 years. So if the same trend continues, including with better infrastructure, better education, a coordinated policy reform, and as Martin said, you know, a great execution with good governance, transparency, I'm very optimistic about the future of Africa. And talking about creating a continental example for the rest of the economies, uh, Your Excellency, Egypt uh, is, is a highlight of, uh, of uh, African growth, I should say, particularly post the COVID-19. Uh, Egypt was one of the strongest economies in 2020 and it continues in 2021. Your debt to GDP ratio is a little over 90%. How did you do that? Um, let me just say that uh, on, on, you know, uh, we also need to encourage South-South cooperation. And that is something that uh, we launched uh, during, we had a conference two weeks ago, the Egypt ICF, International Cooperation Forum. And one of the key highlights was to institutionalize South-South cooperation. So examples, as were mentioned, the green bond or the solar plant or how we uh, involve the private sector in the big projects that we do with the multilateral uh, development banks, how they, their capacity has grown. I think there's a, you know, a, 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 a way uh, and a need to actually showcase what has worked uh, so that we save time uh, and also scale up what has worked so that uh, it is, it is uh, uh, easier for those who want to finance. Um, in our case, the 2% growth in 2020, despite uh, everything that was happening around us, came because there is a belief that reform is a continuous process. We started a very serious economic reforms on the fiscal and monetary side in 2016. Uh, that continued uh, through 2019. Then structural reforms were taking place. So when the pandemic hit, we had enough buffers to, to get us through. And also, we did not do a full lockdown. So there were uh, uh, important uh, uh, steps that we were very preemptive uh, before the pandemic. And that's why 
in good times or in bad times, you, you need to reform. And given the dynamism in the world today, the amount of, 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 uh, of reforms that any government has to do keeps on changing by the day. So you have to be very agile uh, and be able to incorporate this in our policy frameworks. Something else just to conclude on multilateralism. In 2020, uh, uh, you know, we, we, we launched principles of economic diplomacy at the Ministry of International Cooperation to try and actually have uh, stakeholder engagement uh, across uh, uh, our, uh, our dealings with the international community. So we had multi-stakeholder platforms where the uh, IFIs would be there with, with uh, line ministries to, to hear the reform process and what financing needs are needed. Then we did a matching or a mapping of ODA financing to SDGs. So this is very important because every multilateral uh, or, or, or bilateral development partner can know their dollar contributes how much to the global agenda. And this we publicized it on our website and the methodology can be used by other countries. And then finally creating a narrative that can be consistent across our uh, multilateral friends. And that is people at the core because everything we do is for people, uh, projects in action and purpose as the driver. So these are just some of the elements uh, that uh, uh, we try to reflect on multilateralism, but there's a host of reforms that the government has done uh, to be able to weather this storm and give us the potential, the momentum through 2021, with growth rates expected to be uh, higher than 5%. Uh, that's actually amazing. So before we wrap up, uh, given the limitation of time, uh, we truly hear a much stronger sense and a really a, a, a sense of hope for the uh, the revival of uh, global multilateralism and going stronger, particularly in the world's uh, developing regions. And so with that, I would love to, again, uh, ask on behalf of our LSC students a question, because uh, today we have the World Bank, we have the AIIB and the New Development Bank coming out of uh, the emerging world, and we have the world's uh, the strongest, one of the strongest economies here. So uh, what are some of the advice that you may give to our students and maybe our young audience all over the world, if they were to aspire for a global development career, some sort of uh, career aspirations um, to, uh, to follow your footsteps, uh, what are the quintessential qualities that they need to possess today? Maybe we can start with you, Jing Dong. We thank you so much for your time. Certainly, my own journey in multilateralism over the past almost 30 years uh, um, you know, certainly I, um, I have a fulfilling life where you can achieve your professional goals while also have the sense that you're doing something very meaningful in terms of uh, helping humanity. So for uh, the younger generation, I certainly hope that you will use your creativity, your passion, you know, to find new solutions uh, so that, uh, you know, we can achieve the SDG uh, have a have a green and blue planet that is uh, comfortable to live and, and certainly something that we look for the next generation to carry the flag and 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 um, and and i'm sure they will do a better job than, than we do <laughs> that's great what about you martin maybe we'll just take a call oh yeah I'm, I'm, I'm sort of a classical uh, career I'm, I'm almost embarrassed um PhD in economics, joined the World Bank as a YP, global fixed income trader, because I found the initial uh, development work a bit too slow and too boring. And uh, then left Treasury uh, to join IFC, uh, the Asian crisis, ni uh, 98. Um, I think that I would summarize it uh, similar as Chin Dong. It's a privilege to work in a profession that is professionally interesting, but allows you to live your values and 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 your and your vision uh, uh, of of the world to 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 uh, have impact and ultimately i think you should ask yourself uh, in a multicultural environment do you see differences of people as a transaction cost in communication or do you see it as a spice in life and if you see it as a spice in life then these are fantastic environments uh, where you meet many, many interesting people, uh, will 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 start friendships that go way beyond work and and and, and discover you know uh, commonalities. Uh, that is, uh, it's a very unique place. We can truly see that it's a, indeed a small world as well. Well, Your Excellency, uh, uh, 
everybody seems to uh, have a PhD in economics. Is that a quintessential criteria here? Is there a, we need a we need a variety of global talents, right, in various calibers. What's your no, advice? absolutely. Um, I, I I mean I think that uh, the key uh, lesson for me has been humility. Um, uh, you know, in order to be able to collaborate with colleagues, uh, I used to be at the uh, IMF uh, as an EP, and then I went back as advisor to the chief economist. I was at the central bank as sub-governor, uh, and then uh, a minister of tourism, and now minister of international cooperation. And I think uh, what is key in any job you take or in, in designing an ability to sustain your career, you have to be humble. You have to be humble with those around you. You have to uh, listen very well. Uh, you learn from people. Ricardo was correct. There's a comparative advantage, and we all complement one another. And that complementarity is really what uh, I think also defines multilateralism. Mm. And Leslie, what's your uh, what's your advice to the uh, young African students out there? It's always good to be last because I can just say uh, echo what the previous three speakers have uh, said. But in brief, I mean, I would say that um, uh, you know, just imagine yourself what the world would have been like if we faced COVID, each one to his own. And, and, and COVID really sort of in that sense demonstrated the value and importance of multilateral uh, institutions. Most of the biggest, most intractable challenges the world face right now, whether it's uh, the, the pandemic, uh, whether it's climate change, whether it's the challenge of refugees, none of these things we can sort out just by ourselves in each of our, each of our countries. So multilaterals have a very, very important and will become even more important into the future. And as Martin of Qingdong has said, we, you can feel and touch what, what, what we do. Uh, I spent, uh, you know, the better part of my career in Goldman Sachs. I was also vice chairman at Barclays Capital, uh, as well as uh, with the Bank of America, uh, Merrill Lynch, doing mergers, acquisitions, doing traditional corporate finance, if you like. But I, I find the work so much more fulfilling over the last six and a half years in multilateral uh, development banking because we, we work across borders. We, we work for future generations. We, we, we live our values, as, as Martin has said. Mm. Well, thank you so much, uh, Your Excellency, and all our uh, fantastic uh, speakers uh, from the best, uh, uh, you know, career examples from our world of uh, development institutions. So today, uh, allow me to thank everyone on behalf of uh, the Ferociology Institute of Africa and uh, thanking our students for tuning in today. And most importantly, thank you, uh, Your Excellency, Dr. Rania Almashad. Jingdong, uh, Hua, Vice President and Treasurer of the World Bank, Leslie Mastrop, CFO of New Development Bank, and uh, Dr. Martin Kimmich, Chief Risk Officer of the AIIB for joining us today. And I'm sure uh, our students will continue to seek uh, for your inspiration and advice in the, in the years to come. Thank you for your time. Bye-bye. Thank, 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 Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.
I'm greatly honored to have uh, Mr. Jing Donghua, Vice President and Treasurer of the World Bank for a special fireside chat on Africa's future in global development. Jing Dong, you're a Chinese, I hope you don't mind me mentioning, who has been brought to the center of the global multilateral platform, but also your career happened to start with the African Development Bank. So what have you seen over the past decades through your multilateral career about the transformation in Africa? Professor Yu, uh, thank you so much for the invitation and I'm honored to join you to share some of the, uh, the work that we do both in China, but also in Africa, and share some of my perspective. Indeed, uh, I happen to, to have some say in a topic like China and Africa, because uh, you know the first uh, uh, almost 30 years of my life I spent in China, you know, my childhood, my formative years. But then I started my international career uh, in Africa, uh, lived there for three and a half years. And then later when I joined the IC, I certainly visited Africa more than any other continent. So it's, it's a continent where I have a lot of affinity and passion about. Now, uh, just very broadly speaking, uh, uh, first of all, you know, uh, as the World Bank just celebrated 40 years of relationship with China, we certainly can say that China has been an outstanding success when it comes to development. Uh, you know, from the time that China opened up in 1978, uh, you know, China has uh, has had a, a tremendous uh, achievement, and in that journey, the World Bank is very happy to be a, to be a very uh, supportive. You know, I just got this information. I just wanted to mention that we, uh, in the last forty years, we have invested in over four hundred thirty projects in China with a total amount of uh, $64 billion. Mm. And certainly uh, witnessing and supporting China's uh, uh, you know, development plan. So from a poor country to a higher middle income country and continue to grow, it's certainly uh, a, a, a model where we can draw a lot of lessons, including for Africa. Now, when it, when it comes to Africa, you know, the way I look at it is that I can tell you about, uh, you know, from two sides. One is anecdotal. The other is, is what we can see from the World Bank side. Anecdotally, you know, I, I, I worked in, uh, in Africa in the early 1990s. And at that time, China was still in the early journey of development. And Africa was actually trying to go beyond civil conflict. Uh, as a matter of fact, when I was living in Africa, many countries were in civil conflict or regional war. I can mention, you know, I lived in Abidjan. This was 1993 and 1994, uh, all the way till 1997. You know, you have wars in Liberia, in Sierra Leone, in Angola, in Mozambique, and then you have regional conflict in Ethiopia, Eritrea. And of course, uh, the very, very unfortunate genocide in uh, Rwanda and, and in Burundi. So, so if you put you know, the development journey in that context, Africa had only started to focus on development at a later stage than China, mm -hmm. right? But you know, I'm happy to, to see that uh, uh, in the last decade, you know, Africa continent, you know, if you look at uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, which has 48 countries, the vast majority of countries have been making progress. They are peaceful. They have turned their attention to development, right? But of course, you know, it's 48 very different countries with their own culture, history, so on and so forth. Um, so I think it's a journey that we are traveling. But here, let me also turn in institutional. That is, what are the successful factors that China did that could be of relevance to Africa, right? So le let me quickly mention four areas and maybe we can expand a little uh, uh, further in later Q&As. But the first is that China's early decision to open the country up to trade, to take advantage of the, the, the vast pool of labor, right? To do manufacturing, to export, to earn foreign exchange, and then turn it into uh, resources to finance China's development, right? So that is something that China did very well. Africa, uh, you know, recently has launched a continental free trade agreement. 
which means that within Africa region, trade will be, you know, uh, will be much easier to be facilitated. I think that's actually a great momentum uh, and, and certainly the World Bank and many other international organizations are helping. But that is a, 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 a that leads to a second issue that is infrastructure, right? Including, you know, roads, uh, a transport, ports, uh, telecommunications, so on and so forth. The fact that for a long time, it is cheaper to ship something from Shanghai to Mombasa, which is a port city of Kenya, then it is then takes that container from Mombasa to an inland country like Rwanda and Burundi. That really speaks volume about the urgent need for Africa itself to build infrastructure so that the trade can be facilitated, right? Now, what is the difficulty? Uh, you know, a lot of people, when I mentioned the following, really don't get the concept. I said, you know, the map doesn't do Africa justice, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's a northern perspective of the world. The actual size of the Africa continent, how big is it? Well, I tell people, if you drop the United States into Africa, you drop Canada into Africa, then you drop into China into Africa, Africa continent is still bigger than the three countries added together. So you could appreciate the vast landscape and the expense and, uh, you know, to build infrastructure. But nevertheless, that said, it is a big priority, right? To, for Africa to take advantage of the natural resources, its labor force for manufacturing, so on and so forth. So this is the, this is the second. The third, I think China did very well, and I was a beneficiary, is that China focused a lot on basic education, basic health care, right? So, so, you know, when I was growing up, you know, education is very much emphasized uh, because that's actually a foundational piece in terms of, of giving people the knowledge, giving people the skills to participate in a productive, uh, 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 you know, development, and, and, and therefore, the World Bank actually spends a lot of its uh, uh, partnership with Africa on education, on um, you know, healthcare, so on and so forth. The last thing I wanted to mention is financial market. That is, for development to happen, you really need the financing. And you know, all of the international development assistance, whether it's from the World Bank, African Union Bank, from AIIB, added together is a very tiny part that is needed, right? Mm -hmm. In the case of China, China eventually developed the second largest financial market in the world after the United States, right? So China's bond market is now $15 trillion. China's equity market is 10 trillion, right? So when you develop a vibrant financial market, you then have an efficient way to recycle your domestic and grow that domestic statement as a primary source of development financing. So these are the four elements I like to mention. But let me just say, uh, you know, in concluding this first question, is that, you know, when I, when I was in Africa uh, about 30 years ago, you travel around in Africa, when you go through an airport, sometimes you run into difficulty, right? Whether it's immigration customs or even the basic infrastructure of the airport itself. You, you travel to Africa, you know, and you go, this is one sign that Africa is progressing as the rest of the world is. So let me just stop there. And, uh, and happy to answer more questions. My statement is that, is that well, Sub-Saharan Africa has uh, the five of the world's poorest countries. I think that is just factual. But also, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa has the world's today fastest growing economies, so such as Rwanda. So what are some of the other exciting things that are happening in that particular region that you think that the world should know, but don't really talk much about? Early, one of my last trips to Africa uh, uh, was really focused uh, on fintech, right? How we can use fintech 
to leapfrog some of the you know, infrastructure needs. But before we talk about that, let, let's say that this COVID-19 really has, has, uh, you know, uh, has um, posed a global challenge. Mm. Uh, and, and it really highlighted some of the challenges of basic infrastructure. For example, in the United States, in Europe, where you live, uh, even if have to stay home, they do have broad, you know, kids just are left at home and, and, and they have no access to education capability. So how do you make sure you have Wi-Fi, you have, you know, cellular technology, you have telecommunication infrastructure so that as a society, this actually give us, you know, new hope that we can address this right now. But that said, let me, so, so our immediate focus right now in the World Bank and broader global uh, development community is how to help Africa to rebuild Africa post COVID-19, address the healthcare needs, address the education, nutrition, women's health, reproductive health, you know, a lot of things that are immediate. And then of course, climate change, infrastructure, and many other things, uh, private entrepreneurship, so on and so forth. But let me mention two things that I think are exciting. You're absolutely correct. Africa still has some of the poorest countries in the world due to very unfortunate internal civil conflict, wars, terrorism, lack of uh, you know, funding, so on and so forth. But you also mentioned some great successes in terms of, um, of uh, uh, including Rwanda from a country that suffered genocide to one of the most vibrant economies in, in Africa. So in, 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 in that uh, aspect, you know, Rwanda actually has a parliament that is more than half of their parliamentarians are women. They really have made tremendous program in social development, right? Making sure every citizen, including women, are full participants in decision making, in national policy formulation, and in being pro productive, you know, uh, uh, entrepreneurs, workers in, in the society, right? But, but equally importantly, that you know, when I mentioned the first bonds, savings bonds, mm -hmm. that was sold through a cell phone is actually in Kenya. It is because Kenya, over a decade ago, you know, somehow enabled a cell phone based financial inclusion strategy. Therefore, every citizen in Kenya was able to access financial services. So therefore, you know, before uh, M-Pesa, which is the name of the Kenya, uh, you know, FinTech uh, or, or FinTech platform, you know, only about 10% of uh, Kenyans have access to finance. Now it's over 90%. And they have made tremendous progress. So these are exciting role modeling for other Africa countries, right? Because, you know, when you talk about motivation, oh, China, Korea, uh, the, the neighboring countries can have access to funds and technology. You know, if I'm another country in Africa, uh, they will be motivated more. So we, as a World Bank, we very much are working with them to use new technology to help Africa to leapfrog. I remember a couple of months ago, I happened to have this conversation with a Nobel economist, uh, Mike Spence. And so Mike said, post the COVID-19, going back to your question, Jingdu, that uh, Africa almost certainly have to resort to a heavy investment-led economic growth model. So, countries either have to borrow a lot or suffer a lot. But if countries do borrow a lot from the World Bank's perspective and from your personal experience, how do African countries ensure that economic sustainability and the fiscal resilience? Uh, Shirley, that's a great question. So the, the way development finance has evolved, uh, 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 maybe we need to take a step back, right? So in the, you know, just post World War II, I think at that time, it was simply uh, rebuilding. You know, if you give money to build roads, bridges, factories, good things will happen, right? 
from that very simple concept of development to now a human-centric, sustainable development at the center of of the uh, of the development. It's okay, actually, every couple of years, we sit down with the government. We figure out jointly what is the best strategy and what, depending on the country's background, its natural endowment of resources and its uh, current situation. So we have a what we call a very comprehensive country partnership strategy. Okay. So it's a partnership. It's not a relationship of we tell you what to do, right? We already have seven decades of development. We learn from successes, we learn from mistakes, and we share with the country those development experiences that based on the country's uh, uh, specific experiences, let's figure out, okay, the World Bank, what is the angle we can better help you? What are the things that you can work with other partners, so and so forth? First of all, the development plan is country driven. Second is indeed that sustainability is critically important, right? Because you don't want a situation where you pile up foreign debt, where the country cannot absorb, but then later became a burden on the country. So therefore, I think the World Bank actually uh, raised this issue uh, two years ago and, and, and was then, uh, 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 you know, certainly endorsed by the G20 in terms of, and this is because the urgent situation under COVID, right? That how do we then fundamentally resolve the debt sustainability issue? However, debt is not all bad, right? Because when you are developing in the process of development, you need financing, you need uh, especially when your domestic financial resources are not sufficient. You need uh, investment from other countries, of course, naturally in foreign currencies to come in. Our job is really to make sure, on one hand, are those projects tangible? Would they produce a positive economic financial result, but equally important, positive impact on society, um, on the country? Right, so that sustainability goes into our analytical framework in working with the country. But of course, we have to address those already accumulated. Unfortunately, because of factors not caused by the countries themselves, for example, commodity super cycle, where a country relies on commodity export to, to have a steady revenue, all of a sudden, you know, commodity prices collapsed and they lost an important source of revenue and, and therefore they fell into a debt uh, 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 a liability issue. So we have to address the outstanding debt sustainability issue, but equally or even more importantly, going forward, we have to make sure that when we design financing, how do we make sure going forward, the country will not fall back into uh, uh, indebtedness that would not sustain a positive outcome. Well, the World Bank has been a leading example in delivering a development of sustainable goals in Africa, as well as uh, other countries in the world. But today, I must say, though, Jingzhou, the World Bank is no longer the only one that are talking about partnerships, so especially financing partnerships with Africa. So since 2013, we have seen a wave of uh, multilateral institutions that are developed uh, out of China. And you have just mentioned about the AIIB and the New Development Bank, who are going to be at our conference uh, join you as well, but also Chinese uh, development banks as well. Post the COVID-19, China single-handedly held 20% of Africa's total debt. And so will that percentage you think continue to grow out of China's balance sheet? And do they come into competition in Africa with the Brenton Woods institutions such as yours? Well, surely I have been very fortunate myself. I work in five different international multilateral uh, development institutions. So certainly I'm thrilled to see more institutions are created to address the, the critical needs of development finance in a multilateral fashion, right? So having worked in multilateral system for the past 30 years, I very much appreciate because multilateral institutions do represent 
the broadest consensus in terms of what needs to be done in development. What are the priorities, right? From building policy frameworks that is sustainable, the country into transparency, uh, 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 you know, zero tolerance of corruption, because these will build trust, right? Mm -hmm. And then, of course, uh, making sure that sufficient financing goes into the country. The sad reality is that if you add up, you know, AIB, New Development Bank, us, African Union Bank, the total financial investment we can make is a drop in a bucket in the needs of Africa, right? Therefore, I actually, we very much welcome uh, Mr. Jin Li Chin, the president of uh, AIB. Uh, certainly, uh, he was my boss uh, when, I was, when we were working in the Asian Indian Bank together, and I certainly have learned a lot from him. And, uh, uh, and, and uh, AIIB, even before its, uh, its uh, formal launch, had a lot of interaction with the World Bank. And I'm very happy to, to, to say that that partnership, in terms of sharing our experiences in institution formation, in sharing our successes or lessons learned, so on and so forth, I hope that had benefited uh, um, the, the creation of uh, AIIB and New Development Bank not to mention quite a number of senior staff from New Development Bank and AIB came from the World Bank, came from other multilateral institutions. And we have done a lot of projects together. So let me just use one example to showcase the tremendous partnership we have done. So between the World Bank and AIB, we actually did a great investment in Rwanda to support you know, increased credit micro, small, medium-sized enterprises. The way it is done is that AIIB provided $100 million loan, and then the World Bank used our item, which is highly concessional uh, resources, to blend in the cost. So the, the total cost in interest savings over the life of the loan for the clients is 18 basis points. It may be a small number, it adds up, right? And certainly that's a, one of many things we have done together. So, so I, we certainly welcome, you know, the creation of new multilateral institutions, and we believe we play a, a, a big role in this. And the World Bank has been, if I may say, uh, uh, very generous in sharing our knowledge, sharing our policy, uh, sharing our experiences with the new development institutions. And I call Mr. Jin, you know, my elder and, and uh, uh, Leslie, who is a good friend of mine, who is, uh, you know, the CFO of uh, New Development Bank. We are a small circle. And, and let me say again, the total resources of ODA, official development assistance, is so small compared with the needs of development, right? So there is no competition. It's only partnership and working together. And hopefully using our limited resources, not as a direct investment, but to build a investment climate so that billions and trillions of private investment will go to Africa and go to other developing countries. That's really our goal. That is so indeed encouraging to hear that there is such a strong and interesting sense of uh, collaboration across the institutions. But uh, Jingzhou, when uh, talking with your colleagues earlier, two words really got stuck in my mind. One is your colleagues say, well, Jingdong is a true multilateral guy. You believe in multilateralism. And the second word I heard is that you are pro-innovation. I think you are not only pro-innovation in African countries, such as Rwanda, you are actually pro-innovation in designing the World Bank products, financial products at the frontier of global development. However, I must say though, the World Bank today is 75 years old and it itself as an institution needs reform and innovation. I know you have a huge responsibility. What is on your agenda currently to ensure that the World Bank itself as an institution can ensure that the sustainability and resilience as well. We have been given a, a leading role in terms of not only to make sure ourselves, right? The World Bank recently said over a third of our direct financing must be climate. Okay, that's a tremendous commitment, right? And we are we are we are very much. But how do we then use our project as a role model so that it can be replicated as best practices? to crowding private sector investment so that that 
goal of trillion dollars every year gets achieved. So I think although we are 75, we feel very young. Now on the finance side, look, the World Bank uh, introduced the first swap transaction in the world. We issued the world's first global bond. We issued the first world's first green bond. We issued the world's first blockchain bond. And we this year actually helped UNICEF to tap the power of capital market. The World Bank issued a bond where part of the proceed goes to UNICEF backed up by the private donation to UNICEF. And, and, and that's really, really wonderful. Uh, so we stay on the cutting edge of finance, not for the sake of innovation itself, but to constantly find ways to introduce attractive solutions, good for the country, but also uh, attractive enough for the vast pool of savings. A biggest example I want to give you is what we call cat bond, catastrophe bond, right? So very simply, if I'm a finance minister of a country and I tell the infrastructure minister that this year I'll give you 100 million in my local currency, you go build some roads, right? And then unfortunately an earthquake or a typhoon hits the country. You know, if you don't have insurance, what happens is that I will have to call the infra minister, say, sorry, the 100 million I've given to you, I need to take it back because now that money has to go to, uh, you know, humanitarian assistance to our citizens, right? Now, what have we done, the World Bank? We have introduced catastrophe bonds to help countries to uh, mitigate those unexpected events, right? In Latin America, we have issued head bonds for quite a number of countries, several billion dollars. Recently, we helped Jamaica to do a bond, uh, $180 million for two or three cyclone seasons. In the sense that when cyclone hits, right? Uh, and, and, and it's what we call parametric, meaning that if it hits certain uh, uh, level, there is an automatic payout to the country. So that instead of taking back the, the money building infrastructure, there is money from the bond investors that will go to the country. So these are wonderful innovation, you know, hopefully one day will, will, will you know, significantly increase private sector's participation. Now you would wonder why a private sector uh, investor would buy a catastrophe bond where they could lose money. Well, for two reasons. Number one, bond that pays very little because of, so you get an extra yield, right? That normally you wouldn't have. The second is a cat bond is not correlated to the behavior of regular fixed income bond. It's not driven by, you know, the Federal Reserve's announcement or inflation number. Therefore, uh, you know, surely you're an economics professor. It achieves great diversification effect. Mm -hmm. so, so, you know, this is very exciting as a treasurer of the World Bank that we use innovation uh, uh, to scale up finance. So that Surely, I hope uh, I don't look 75 years old. In any event, you know, uh, the 75 is a new 30 years old. We are in our prime. Jingdo, I cannot let you go without asking a question on behalf of me. I'm sure many students, they would aspire to have a career like yours. What are the essential skills do you recommend in order to meet the challenges of future global development? Well, thank you. And certainly my best wishes to your students. Uh, you know, the first answer is that being at S, uh, LSE itself is a great start to go into development, right? Because it's a, it's, a, it's a prestigious institution. It sits in London, which is one of the most important global financial centers. Uh, and look, I mean, it's very simple. Um, um, you, you, you need to have a passion for development. Um, and uh, that passion then should drive you to learn a, a field that you find interesting, right? Whether it is economics, health, healthcare, agriculture, you know, climate change, so on and so forth. Because you need to start using expertise, right? As an angle to help. 
because the World Bank, like all the other multilateral banks, we address virtually all the SDG goals, right? With the with ultimate goal of eradicating poverty and build a common prosperity for humanity. So, so have a passion, find an area of expertise as a starting point. Well, of course, uh, while you are pursuing your academic study, find opportunities to do internship at uh, you know, institutions like the World Bank, the United Nations, the IIB, New Development Bank, and watch out for, uh, watch our uh, websites. And, and uh, you know, I think uh, I would urge you to, to read our present and speeches because that actually is very important in terms of uh, where the international development thinkings are. And uh, watch our vacancy postings and, and apply for jobs, right? And if you get turned down once or twice, don't be discouraged. We are very fortunate for every position we open. We do have many, uh, uh, many motivated candidates. But I think if you keep trying and uh, meanwhile, accumulate experiences, uh, you are getting it. Accidentally, I heard that, uh, you know, you actually wasn't selected for the first time when you were applying for a World Bank job. I didn't even get a reply and uh, instead I started as a young professional in African Union Bank and therefore look I mean it really actually that's a great uh, a great great way to say eventually you are able to achieve it you will get there can focus on it at a later stage than China, right? But, you know, I'm happy to, to see that I didn't even get a reply. And uh, instead I started as a young professional in African Union Bank and therefore- You will get there. Thank you so much, Jing Donghua, Vice President and Treasurer of the World Bank. We thank you so much for your time. You're welcome. Thank you.
I first came to Africa. It was to Abidjan in the Ivory Coast just over 50 years ago. It was to participate on behalf of the U.S. Treasury in the drafting of the Articles of Agreement of the African Development Fund. My most recent trip to Africa was to Addis Ababa in late February of last year, just before the pandemic curtailed travel. I'd gone to Ethiopia to meet with representatives of nine African countries seeking entry into the WTO, the World Trade Organization, as well as with Ethiopian officials about their own country's application. These two visits are the African bookends of my career in public service. Well, not quite. On a brisk, clear morning a week later, on March 1 of this year, in my last official act as co-acting Director General of the WTO, I stood on the front steps of the WTO to welcome its first African Director General and first woman in that position, Dr. Ngozi okonjo uela My purpose in talking with you today is to put the Pan-African Agreement in the context of the global trading system, a system embodied in the World Trade Organization. Facilities that exist for both the African uh, Continental Free Trade Agreement and the WTO. The AFCFTA should be transformative. It is a blueprint for the freer movement of goods, services, and people across Africa for the benefit of all. According to the World Bank estimates, the Pan-Continental uh, Agreement could lift 30 million people out of extreme poverty. As the largest free trade area in terms of number of participating countries, the FTA can provide the economies of scale needed to attract investments in higher value added production, generate innovation driven growth and entrepreneurship through linking the markets in Africa. While concentrating on African regional growth should be a top priority for Africa, it should never be forgotten that most of the world's markets lie outside of Africa. Africa accounts for 20% of the world's population, but only 3% of global GDP. Even with African growth above the world average, a two-track model is needed, substantially improving intra-African trade while deepening engagement with the rest of the world. What is required is not only an increase in cross-border trade in Africa in agriculture and raw materials, but also in industrial products and services. Africa must also accelerate deeper involvement in global value chains, as Southeast Asia has done so successfully. Regional integration is not a substitute for global engagement. The two are complementary. Regional and multilateral integration through membership in the AFCFTA and the WTO can knit together an African continent that can help unify and amplify Africa's voice on the global stage in pursuit of sustainable peace and development. Economic connectivity can bring inclusive and sustainable peace, political stability, and higher standards of living. One important means to enhance the prospects of success in the regional integration agenda is participation and engagement with the WTO. Nine African countries, Algeria, Comoros, Equatorial Guinea, Ethiopia, Libya, Sao Tome and Principe, Somalia, South Sudan and Sudan are in the process of acceding to the WTO to join the 44 African countries that are already members. WTO accession represents a tool to strengthen the rule of law, ensure policy predictability and transparency, and promote international trade cooperation. It emphasizes the presence of necessary frameworks and practices that are required to create an environment that fosters economic development and attracts foreign investment. The WTO accession process and membership help these nations acquire and strengthen the structures that they need to take full advantage of the benefits that can be derived from the AFCFTA. The WTO Secretariat and its members of the WTO can offer crucial support 
through technical assistance and policy advice as governments undertake implementation of the regional free trade agreement. Two areas which come to mind for immediate practical assistance. First, the secretariat can help with technical work of implementing the agreement, the scheduling, certification, and verification of the provisional tariff concessions. Second, the WTO can facilitate discussions on difficult issues involved in integration, such as rules of origin. Resolving the complexities of moving goods across borders, making it easier for goods originated in Africa to obtain duty-free treatment in participating African countries is essential to obtaining the full positive benefits of the agreement. The Chief of Staff of the, Sec of the Secretary General of the AFCFTA Secretariat, Mr. Silver Okjokol, has called on governments and businesses from party states to prioritize what he describes as low-hanging fruit, particularly agricultural trade. This is an area where the WTO can be particularly helpful. Tariffs can slow trade, and it's an object of the AFCFTA to eliminate them as a meaningful barrier. But more insidious, less transparent are non-tariff barriers, particularly in the form of standards. Failure to meet a standard can halt trade in a product entirely. More often, sanitary and phytosanitary standards, it's called SPS, increase trade costs, and this can be of critical importance. Standards are crucial to agricultural value chains and to improving competitiveness and the quality of made in Africa goods and services. Reducing these barriers can especially benefit small and medium-sized enterprises, SME, which will be particularly helpful to funnels in compliance with standards and conformity assessment procedures in developing countries for agricultural products and essential for moving food across borders. An example where standards will be particularly important, however, is not just agriculture, but with respect to the development of solar energy, which is key to African development. There's an opportunity for Africa to lead the world in regional harmonization of standards for solar energy products. The new frontier of standards is moving towards climate-related standards. The WTO should either broaden the scope of the existing STDF or create a new facility to address industrial quality infrastructure needs. The WTO is a forum where all economies have a role to play, no matter what their stage of development. During my recent service as Deputy Director General of the WTO, I chaired the Director General's Consultative Forum on Cotton Development Assistance. The moving force behind the initiative were four of the poorest WTO members, West African countries, Benin, Chad, Mali, and Burkina Faso. The basis for making the forum work, for delivering benefits to these countries, was the, their pragmatic approach, the four countries' pragmatic approach to identifying their needs with specificity. Pragmatism, as opposed to demands for the fulfillment of rights not universally acknowledged, is a way to achieve greater responsiveness of the international community to contribute trade. It's by the resources, not physical infrastructure. Physical infrastructure, however, is not the only impediment to continental integration. African governments should consider introducing simplified customs clearance at the borders to streamline the movement of goods. In this regard, the WTO's trade facilitation agreement and trust fund are directly relevant. The importance of cutting red tape, creating greater efficiency and transparency, cannot be overstated, especially for landlocked countries. In meeting the trade challenges of the 21st century, the rapid rise of e-commerce is particularly important and has been brought to the forefront of the through WTO negotiations. It should do so, both within the AFCFTA and within the WTO. It should be a leader. The WTO can also play a constructive role in facilitating the restoration of trade finance. The COVID-19 pandemic has exacerbated the pre-existing state 
of diminished availability of trade finance, a widening gap amounting to $1.5 trillion worldwide has frustrated developing countries' participation in international trade, impeding the ability of international trade to support post-COVID economic recovery and the ability of small businesses to capitalize on being and be included in the benefits of free trade. And the aftermath of the financial crisis just over a decade ago, the WTO brought together major international financial institutions, banks, private sector actors to address this need of trade finance. It can do so again with a focus on mobilizing financing for MISMIs, the micro and medium small enterprises, and leveraging big data and artificial intelligence to counter the trade finance rollback. Additional financial resources more broadly are needed to enhance the effectiveness of the AFCFDA during this time of global crisis. One possible approach would be a partnership between the WTO, the World Bank, the IMF, the African Development Fund, and the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank to create a Pan-African Fund for Trade, an AFT, a Pan-African Fund for Trade, dedicated to the economic integration of the African continent. AFCFTA members of the WTO can make the multilateral trading system have a fresh outlook for a positive future through trade. The secretariats of the WTO, the African Union, the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa, and AFCFTA should collaborate to make the most of the synergies between the continental agreement and the acquis of the multilateral trading system. My hope is that the voice of Africa will be strong and positive in the WTO, leading on issues that should be of common continent-wide interest, such as the adoption of a ban on export restrictions when it comes to purchases by the World Food Program, WFP. There's no reason why this can't be accomplished, should be accomplished with African leadership. Africa's narrative is changing, and the continent should seize the opportunities presented by the AFCFTA to liberalize trade and investment and introduce the necessary reforms that would make Africa an even more attractive investment destination for both domestic and foreign investors. Proper and effective implementation of the AFCFTA is key to realize its full potential as an instrument to achieving robust economic growth and sustainable development of the continent. African policymakers should harness the synergies between the WTO and the AFCFTA to achieve this laudable objective. They should call upon the WTO members to constitute a working party backed by a cross-divisional secretariat task force to help assure that the resources of the WTO are fully mobilized to help assure that the AFCFTA fulfills its bright promise. I thank you very much. I wish you well in this conference. I'm sorry I can't be with you in person.
of Africa's youth with China. We have uh, some distinguished speakers with us. First of all, Ruth Kagia, Deputy Chief of Staff to the President of Kenya. Siddharth Chatterjee, UN Resident Coordinator in China. Professor Haifang Liu, Director of Center for African Studies at China's Peking University. My name is Shou Yu. So today we will be talking about some fundamental game changers to the future of African dynamics that is brought by China's various uh, educational initiatives. So first of all, Haifang, since you are uh, right at Peking University based in Beijing, under China's uh, China-Africa FOCAC initiative, China has in the recent years formally institutionalized the educational initiatives for African students in China. Would you mind giving us a sense of uh, the Chinese government initiatives there? Thank you, Shelley, for the question and then for the opportunity to join this panel. Uh, I am indeed, as an educator, uh, heavily involved for the kind of a, uh, educating African youth, and not only you know our, our own students, but also widely international students lately. Uh, but also myself have been just uh, doing a research, particularly about uh, China's policy to uh, support Africa to come to study in China. So I, uh, I'm, I, I'm, I am confident, confident to, to say that I, I do know a little bit about uh, uh, the issue you just raised. Uh, in terms of uh, institutional um, uh, mechanism are currently uh, we have a uh, Chinese uh, uh, Ministry of Education coordinating with the Ministry of Finance and then also several other organizations to set up a very um, solid support for uh, African youth to be educated in China. So uh, currently we also have a um, scholarship of a uh, a Chinese scholarship of a con uh, council, yes, scholarship of council, that's the full name, CS. As uh, one of the funding organizations is really specifically focused on all the international students coming to um, be supported by Chinese government. And uh, at the same time, some form of this type of support about uh, 20 percent and you also have about 10% of uh, uh, in, in total for scholarship coming from university or college levels. Yeah, so this is a, the rough picture for uh, supporting African students to come to study in China. Right. And uh, in terms of, uh, yeah, maybe just another information for uh, the management levels in the university, we actually in whole Chinese um, uh, I mean, we have uh, nearly 300 universities now is uh, accepting, are accepting students um, uh, and uh, uh, African students definitely one of the very important part uh, hold about one third in total and then um, in each university there are also um, a, a specific of Office called the International Students Office is in charge of all this uh, students' affair. Right. So, so it does seem like there is a whole of government and whole of state approach in treating the future educational opportunities for African students in China. But can you give us also the scale of that the Chinese scholarships that you were talking about? I understood that somewhere around 2020, China was given as many as 80,000 scholarships to African students to study in China. That's quite massive. What's the state? Uh, like? I think there are lots of, uh, um, you know, information not necessarily, the number you, you were just uh, talking about, 80,000 actually cover both uh, the uh, funded, the governmental uh, funded students, but also those self-funded students. In total, actually, um, I just uh, mentioned the, uh, the government CSC, uh, Chinese Scholarship Council, we also have government and then also university levels of finance. So in total, this three parts, we only have uh, half 
eight, uh, uh, 12.8 percent in total are financed by Chinese in any way. And then the, the rest, which means nearly 88 percent coming uh, by, their, them, by their own, by uh, financed by themselves. So it's a very, uh, you know, um, so the, specifically the number such, such as 2019 before the COVID, we actually saw the number which is uh, uh, 66,000 financed by, um, by government. And then um, uh, the rest, uh, the rest, uh, there are in total in, uh, in, in, oh, sorry, I'm talking about uh, the total number, including both this 66,000 um, are numbers of finance um, from everywhere, from Asia, from uh, even some European, some American university uh, students are financed by this uh, CSC scholarship. Mm -hmm. And then for uh, African students, uh, there are uh, also the similar uh, per, uh, proportion, only 12%. And then all the rest are, uh, are self-financed. Right. I hope I'm clear. Um, <laughs> just a quick question. Is this per year or every three years? Um, you know, this is a kind of, a, you, all, you of course have accumulated some students it works for three years, some um, uh, works for four years. So it depends on the program. And then this is- What I mean is when you say 66,000 or 8,000, are you saying new intake of 8,000? No, the, uh, the way how uh, the statistic uh, uh, method is accumulative. So they are just uh, uh, calculating each year they need to support uh, the first uh, grade or second grade. So in total, this is the year they are supporting. So nearly 60,000. Um, otherwise, uh, I, uh, there is no another kind of a method to statistic mm -hmm. each year. Uh, sure. But uh, uh, there is a definitely a very, uh, as um, Shelley just mentioned, a very fast increase. Uh, scale like uh, 2018 one china african summit held um uh, president xi jinping announced 80,000 80,000 for 3 years only for african students uh, what number i just mentioned was uh, for everyone covered the whole world so ruth you are over there overseeing one of the most dynamic and one of the most important african economies Kenya, and you did mention, uh, the, and uh, you have very strong convictions that uh, China has reaped a demographic dividend over the past uh, four decades of reform and opening up journey, and that China can today help Africa also reap the demographic dividend, but how so? Uh, thank you, Shelley, and thank you for uh, inviting me to this very important meeting. Uh, before I, I respond to your question, uh, I want to say that timing of this program that you are introducing at LC is perfect in history that's going to shape dynamics not just in China and Africa but and every country in one way or another is reviewing its development strategy to make sure that they adjust effectively uh, to the new post-COVID normal so the timing is, 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 is perfect and uh, even more so because there's a convergence of three important factors. One is just uh, how relationships and engagements uh, are going to be aligned post-COVID. It is the critical which huge potential of the continent. When those three together, you see a program that you could develop that begins to define the way forward, not just for, for purposes of, 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 of LLC, but in terms of sort of re reshaping uh, the, 
the development and cooperation agenda going forward. And that is the context in which I want to uh, premise my remarks. Uh, and basically say that in a short time, 20 years essentially since uh, FOCAC was established, China has defined a central role uh, in the continent, um, recognized more, more so by the infrastructure uh, gaps that it has helped to, 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 to close, uh, which was one of the critical uh, constraints to development, and that has been very important in its own right. The role of training and skill development and human development uh, by China in Africa is less muted, and it could be sharpened. The numbers may be large, but what I would like to propose is there's a lot of school we align that in order to um, realize a similar demographic uh, dividend. Um, when you look at how China was able to basically transform its economy in one generation, an underlying reason was the quality of human capital, the very fast ramping up of the skills and the education of its people. We need a similar uh, process uh, in Africa. And whereas African youth are much better educated than 20 years ago, there are still a lot of gaps in quality, in equity, and more importantly, in terms of sort of 25. Um, so improving the quality with a focus on soft skills, 25 skills, digital skills becomes important. So one of the things I would like to propose to you uh, Professor Haifang, is as we look at a thousand or so people that are being trained, look a little bit more closely at the quality at the content of that training to align it to 21st century skills. So that's one. The same is in terms of release the graphic dividend, and again, China did this very well, is how you linked growing um, human development skills labor market and for, for, for work. So how we allow, enable young people in Africa to access job opportunities, to me, a critical entry point is technology because technology will enable our constraints of infrastructure in terms of school infrastructure, constraints of technical capacity in terms of not very strong retained teachers. Uh, technology will help to close those gaps very quickly. Secondly, it closes the uh, gap as, as we are doing this this, this, this morning. Uh, we are talking to, to you from, from across the world. And that is now, as we saw uh, during COVID, the the done as she so we need to align our education and training system in terms of how those movements are, 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 are being reshaped. So what I'm saying is the training China is offering is immense, but um, we could use this opportunity, this in section point of COVID. But yeah, um, uh, amazing labor for at least to be able to assist and to shape Africa's educational dynamics as well. We'll come back to you on the digital space. And then I listen to the ladies that I heard that you co authored an article with the former president 
got up. But if you look at the East Asian economies, let's look specifically at Korea and China that have experienced a significant youth population in the 60s and 70s. Both countries thereafter embarked on a remarkable growth trajectory and their economic growth from middle to a higher income level in a very short time. And the lessons of the Chinese miracle indicate that there were four major investments that they made. They made an investment in education and skills. They made an investment in empowerment and making sure that women were freed up to join the labor force. And therefore, you know, when, uh, when General Mao talks about women who hold up half the sky, is very true as it resonates in, in China. Just a statistic here. Of the 80 women who are billionaires all over the world, two-thirds are Chinese. This is very significant of a nation state that has actually allowed the full realization of the third E is employment, and having employment is the key, and the fourth is equity, which is the principle of leaving no one behind. I believe the whole five-year plan is a reflection of that. Now, African governments, Shirley and colleagues, spend about 5% of GDP on education, which is perhaps second highest in the region. However, the efficiency of the spending is low, and the region currently faces an annual $40 billion gap in education and finance. Now, a recent report by the African Development Bank also provides recommendations on how governments can improve education and spending efficiency and mobilize additional resources. But I think in the space of education and skills, it is not just about African students coming to China to be trained and to be educated, but what about Chinese institutions coming into different parts of Africa, not only going through the normative education system of the bachelor's and master's degree, but more importantly, is to address the phenomenal skills gap that we have amongst, uh, uh, amongst the African youth. Rapid urbanization is also associated also with a young potential workforce migrating in search of jobs, can change the landscape of human settlement, pose, and these could pose significant challenges for living and health conditions, education levels, and, and the environment. Our NIO study said an overwhelming majority of African youth aged between 15 to 24 are informally employed with no or little education, are rural-based, and mainly engaged in subsistence agriculture. Yet, in, as Ruth talked about the digital revolution, there are more than, more than 400 that have sprung up across the continent. Later, I hope to internationally recognized logical centers. The COVID-19 pandemic has accelerated digitalization absolutely in the world, it's sharpening the need for technical and vocational skills aligned with Africa's development and the need for a youthful population focused on science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Here is again a place of congruence between China and Africa. And I know that not just OPA, but there is a very deliberate pushed by China to make sure that Africa becomes what it wants to be in terms of the Africa free trade area, in terms of the success of the African Union uh, 2063 agenda. Let me make one quote from President uh, uh, Uhuru Kenyatta, who said back in 2015, 2016, he said youth unemployment is an existentialist threat. And he's absolutely right. Now, now if actually invest in 40 years of going from abject poverty of, of, a, of a per capita GDP of $180 to that of around $12,000 per capita today and is likely to touch $25,000 per capita by 2025 was because it made those investments in those education, in those skills, in the empowerment, in the employment. And I believe that now is the time 
to turn, as I say, the, the demographic dividend into a real dividend, and it will be reaped when we make those investments. And I see an ideal partnership here between African governments, um, the United Nations system, as well as, as, well as uh, uh, the Chinese government. And here is where we can see an ideal nexus of what the UN Secretary General calls upon all of us, of bridging the South-South divide, of bridging the South-North divide, and allowing more South-South cooperation, more South-South learning, more South-South partnerships to take place. Over to you. Thank you. So it is very interesting you talked about that African governments in general have been investing 5% of GDP into education. However, it's not efficient. How do you measure efficiency of that education? Are you saying that uh, basically the input of uh, educational resources are not being used to produce the right sort of talents in Africa today? Okay, so let's, let's take, for example, uh, you know, uh, the issue is, the education matching the economy and the future economy. So while we are investing in a lot of the traditional education system, which is also part of a, of a colonial past, uh, surely, you know, and it is informed by that. But we do have an opportunity, uh, for example, of investing more in the kind of skills that is needed. Today, if you look uh, at uh, numbers, masons, carpenters, vendors, those skill sets that are necessary for nature, building in the space of BRI, which is very, very important in Africa, because without the Belt and Road Initiative, without the digital and physical infrastructure, we will have no Africa free trade area. Very important. But the labor force that needs to accompany this sort of infrastructure development needs to be skilled up. So that is where I see ideal collaboration between the private sector, state-owned enterprises, the public sector, governments coming together. Because for Africa, the number one priority has to be its youthful population. Over 70% of the population is less than 30. As I said, 900 million people, young people will be, join, uh, will be there by 2050. Every 24 hours, 35,000 African young people are looking for work in the age group of 15 to 30. And that translates to about 12 million uh, a year. Imagine, now if you were talking about the federal, imagine if these people were to get onto boats and head to Lampedusa and get to Europe, there is no way the combination of the European Coast Guard, Air Force, Army, Navy can stop that new insertion. However, we could turn this around because the future economic growth, the velocity will be in Africa because the rest of the world is aging. China, Japan, all of the Asian tigers, Europe, all of them are aging. I mean, I'll give you another statistic here. The median age of Kenya, for example, is 18. The median age of Sweden is 47. So you can see how that chasm is there but the future of consumption and production is going to be in Africa. So it is actually, I would call upon to China to invest much more in the African continent because I believe the return of investment will be there in the future years. Over to you. Very interesting. Uh, Ruth, you earlier talked about uh, the dig digital transformation that China has been trying to bring to the African economies. And I think Sid is alluding also to something similar, which is using the digital technologies to uh, collaborate across continents on the uh, educational, various educational platforms. So China has been supporting Africa uh, with the adoption of the digital technologies and uh, in countries uh, such as Kenya, uh, we do see some transformations in that space. So could you give us some on the ground experience of China's actual plans and, and uh, strategies, training strategies there? Thank you, uh, thank you. China has uh, made a lot of contribution to um, uh, to digital techno the digital footprint uh, in, in in Africa, uh, I believe Kwae um, provides about percent uh, of the um, uh, of, 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 of the basic connectivity uh, in the continent. So it's it's a, it's a predominant force. Um, the I, I think it's more a question of aligning that force to the felt needs of the young people 
people in the continent so that it's not simply an importation of technology. It is also, in this case, uh, to be able to innovate through the positives, uh, which are sort of uh, evident. Um, two weeks ago, we visited a hospital in a rural part of Kenya that is doing telemedicine, connecting to the biggest national hospital and enabling doctors uh, to do complicated diagnosis and, and, and surgery. That is the way forward. And the technology platform they were using was provided by Huawei. So that there's no doubt China is a major contributor uh, uh, to this. I uh, would like to take that further forward to make sure that the, um, the digital infrastructure is expanded to many more places. It's not just one hospital there, one school there, but the technological infrastructure to supporting in the development of skills, uh, digital skills. Uh, we have uh, an ongoing digital edu uh, education program, but it has been slow to, to, to become universalized. Um, the devices, for example, uh, uh, because of teacher training. So making sure that the total ecosystem, digital ecosystem from the hardware to the software is sort of fully fully made available. At the moment, there are a lot of gaps in that uh, ecosystem. So the the, the, question, the the request here is to advance that very strong technology footprint in Africa into strengthening the so interestingly, uh, Africa, because uh, Africa's uh, development experience is sort of started later. This is, uh, was from a conversation I just had with the vice president of the World Bank, Jing Dong. And he said, well, you have to remember in the 1990s, Africa just came out of regional wars and conflicts and unfortunately genocide. And so that development experience just started to kick off in the late 90s and things have been actually are happening very fast to give Africa credits. So now it just seems that when China started to develop in the 1970s, China moved into trade, the low end jobs, the light industries and developed industries primarily in manufacturing. But now Africa is moving fully, jump by jumping in the generation fully into digitals. So let's um, have, uh, let's say imagine that we have all these uh, African students, official leaders of Africa who have uh, graduated from China with a formal education back to Kenya. So when they apply for that job opportunity in Kenya, Kenya how competitive are they in the marketplace in comparison to African students say, well, have gotten an LSC degree from the UK or from Harvard, say, for example. Um, it, it's, um, it's, it, that's a complicated comparison to make because um, you'll find, for example, a graduate from uh, a US university uh, may be looking for employment in US companies here, and you've got lots, you know, the UK alone has about 200 companies. Kenya. So a UK graduate most likely be much more competitive uh, in UK based industries. In a similar way, a graduate from Chinese universities, uh, the first port of call uh, is likely to be um, programmed um, uh, in a uh, context. So it's, it's not, it's apples and oranges in, in, in a sense. Uh, but what I can say for a fact is students who have been trained abroad bring a broader view of the world, whether it is a, a broader view of West or they bring a, a broader view of the world, which makes it easier for them to become more competitive than those who have not trained abroad because the, the value of education is how it broadens their mind. It raises the ambition. It, it releases the innovative creativity. And, and it almost uh, where that has taken place as long as it has been quality and it is relevant to the, to the, to the situation on the ground. Mm. Uh, Charlie, maybe, maybe, maybe I could come in and, and you know, just to reinforce that point. You know, I'm, I'm a Princeton University graduate and, and a very proud graduate of Princeton University. 
I have, I have interacted with many universities here in China. And I can tell you one thing. At the end of the day, education is the same. The curriculum development is the same. And, you know, the kind of work that, I'm, that I see happening in China, in the space of artificial intelligence, in the space of quantum computing, in the space of uh, semiconductors, in the space of fintech and biotech, is pretty remarkable. So, you know, I, I really believe that, and today I have people with Chinese degrees, university degrees working on my team, and they are the best of class. I mean, truly the best of class. So it really is, I go back to what we said, it is uh, about, you know, there, there is no comparison here. I believe all education systems are by and large the same. And where, where China has come from to where China is, we have a large number of international students actually accessing their, their education system. And, and so on, on that count, I would say that they are very much, you know, uh, very much aligned. I hope that, I wish I was younger. Uh, I would have loved to have done another mid-career master's program, perhaps at, 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 uh, at Peking University or at Tsinghua University, a phenomenal university. And let me tell you what we are trying to do. What we at the United Nations are trying to do, and this is the conversation actually I've had with, uh, with uh, Ruth and, and, and the president of Kenya, we feel that the SDGs that are, that are, are critical, it's a roadmap. We have a, we have a window in front of us, which is, which, the, which, uh, which is known as the decade of action, the sustainable development goal. And youth employment relates both to the technical and the vocational skills for employment, decent jobs, entrepreneurship, and for productive employment and decent work, the achievements of, let's say, SDG 4, which is quality education, and SDG 8, which is about decent work and economic growth, is the key for the development of the largest generation of youth in the world, which is in Africa. Now, the governments, therefore, can play a facilitating role in helping forth the private sector, state-owned enterprises, all coming together and bringing the different dynamics in this context, the UN and China has already started work with the several universities in the US, in Africa, in China, to look at an applied research center or a, a center of excellence, which will, be, which will consist of four intellectual leaders from China, US, US, EU, Africa, to look at Af the continent and look at what kind of mechanisms, triangular corporations around policy changes that, that face Africa, particularly in the space of unemployment and investment in education. So practical immense opportunity. Practical education. So I found uh, interestingly, uh, Ruth and uh, Sid has been talking about this two-way educational exchange, both for African students in China, but also Chinese universities in Africa. What are Chinese universities doing in Africa today? Do you see a strong push there? Um, I would say we do uh, have uh, several universities, such as um, uh, what Mr. said, just say what he want to be registered to affiliate with our university and also our neighbor, Tsinghua University, and then several were actually set up a, a fairly new program called African Youth Leadership Program. Uh, not necessarily only for targeting at uh, Africa, actually, it's just called Global China okay. Program, but uh, it's a focus on leadership training. And for those, uh, we actually, I'm sitting as one of the recruit uh, committee members. So each year we actually recruit very excellent elite unit students um, uh, globally. We are not following the uh, traditional way like uh, China, Chinese embassy in each hosting country to work with their ministry. We actually just open the online applications to everyone. Just claim you are a national, for instance, in as a Kenyans, you can just uh, apply for that as long as you have a, a graduate, you have a bachelor degree already, then you can be enrolled if uh, we test you as a qualified one. You, if you, you are those kind of a, a pers personality have a leadership uh, uh, spirit. So this has been several university now a kind of a new approach to do this kind of a training. Uh, for me, we can use the word as you said a push because uh, it's really going everywhere trying to grab. Um, but I think there is also a very different uh, 
uh, things between China and the bigger power like US, like UK, because uh, traditionally, um, since late 1980, uh, 50, sorry, 50, when China just set up its relationship with all African countries and also Asian country, Latin American country, China never tried to seek for human resource or talents from the world, from other countries. So the, the goal has been rather serving for making friends and then expanding China's international understandings. So for, for those kind of a goal, um, China's policy has been whoever use Chinese scholarship, uh, you have to go back to your own countries to serve your, your own country. Now the policy is still ongoing, but I think uh, as Mr. Said already uh, pointed out, there are lots of a new development, like uh, lots of a uh, private sector is joining and then different kind of a scholarship, for instance, coming from Huawei, from different companies, they are not a governmental scholarship. So there is no this kind of regulation that you have to um, you know, go back to return to your own country. And now we have seen lots of African talents also working for Chinese companies. And uh, I think uh, uh, another thing that we also have to pay attention to is also the scale, what you just emphasized. Because uh, um, initially, indeed, if we go back to 1996, uh, before all those previous 40 years, uh, all Chinese, um, you know, attraction for African students really based on scholarship or Ch Chinese government scholarship. And then only thereafter, and also exactly after that year, we have seen um, the, this kind of a, a self finance the students increase heavily. Means in total, China's uh, education now is serving more for a kind of service trade rather than only scholarship attraction. Because if we say the number, we read it clearly: 20, a uh, twelve percent coming uh, with a scholarship, and the, all the rest are self-finance. So, uh, as uh, um, Mr. Said already emphasized. This really means a lot about Chinese education. There is a big practical attraction. They find they have more skill to learn. Specifically, they, they, they can you know, work with the Chinese com uh, companies, which uh, we already know. I guess, uh, Shelley, you probably also know the um, statistic made by McKinsey uh, two or three years ago. There were uh, already 20,000 according to their statistic, but maybe now we have seen more. So mm -hmm. how this 80,000 Chinese company, you know, what operate in African continent, obviously um, uh, there is a big uh, space for, for those who got education from China to find their opportunities. So in that way, you can see directly and indirectly things are changing and then the demand and then also what China's education, um, the role it can play is also changing. It's uh, quite a dynamic, quite a diversified. That's very interesting. So basically, Haipong, what you're saying is uh, you remember a couple of decades ago when our generation, we went overseas to study and a lot of the best Chinese actually stayed where they studied and uh, contributed to the local economy. So you're not saying that because of that job opportunity, China is actually allowing international students to stay and to work for Chinese uh, next generation of uh, multinationals as well. Uh, I think, yeah. It's a kind of an emerging trend. Right, it's really interesting. However, I want to go back to my earlier question though. Uh, Ruth, from where you are, do you see Chinese uh, university or educational institutions presence widely in Africa within the African continent today? Ruth? Can you, can you? Do you see, sorry. So from where you are, do you see a wide presence of Chinese universities and educational institutions within the broader African continent today? 
if you compare the presence of China in Africa in infrastructure, every place uh, you see uh, some infrastructure that has been con constructed institutions, they are much fewer uh, in, uh, you know, in relative terms. Uh, and, but quite a few universities have institutes like Confucius Institute uh, here in, in, in Nairobi, uh, the, some training, uh, a bit of digital training, but it is not much yet. At the moment, uh, a lot of the movement is to China uh, as opposed to China coming to Africa. And that is what Sid mentioned earlier, we need to see more of. Interesting. Haifang, are you planning to move there to Africa? No, I will. I'm anxious to be able to work as an educator in Africa. More than that, <laughs> actually. Right. Yeah, I think Ruth is quite correct uh, in terms of uh, the presence. If we really to compare with uh, the scale of China's infrastructure, we need more this kind of. Uh, and it's a scale of quite uh, complicated for any university to have a branch uh, uh, abroad. Currently, we only have, um, our university only have two branches. One is in Chicago. The other one is in, um, in, uh, in Cambridge, in UK. So I think that these are quite a, a kind of, a, you know, difficult, complicated things to move. Uh, but uh, as uh, Ruth also suggests, uh, uh, CI, Confucius Institute so far in the continent play quite an important role. We have seen some, uh, you know, uh, against or uh, different kind of, a, uh, 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 how to say, I mean, in UK or in um, US, we have seen uh, those uh, moved to against the Chinese uh, Confucius Institute, but uh, we have to have done lots of research in different can Confucius Institute in Africa. Mm -hmm. I, I think largely we can see maybe even um, everyone, every institute uh, in Africa play very, very important role in terms of a provide a language training and the provide a culture um you know platform for two sides to get right. to know yeah sure. to really conquer the the barrier between the two sides yeah, and especially is the yeah the relationship rather happen in the working field so language and culture is very important so that's mm -hmm. why we emphasize confucius institute uh, so, Shirley, I, just, Shirley, I just want to comment i want to comment with a very particular quote from the United Nations Secretary General, which he said at the 76th session of the General Assembly, when he unlocked or unpacked his, uh, you know, the, the common agenda for, for the future of humanity. And he said that there are six great divides that we must bridge in peace, in climate, in equality, in gender, in digital, and amongst generations. And he made it clear that young people will inherit the consequences of our decisions, good or bad. Therefore, we must prove to the young people that despite the seriousness of the situation, the world has a plan. And where China, the UN, and the rest of the world can come together is to precisely unlock the talent and the ideas and the energies of Africa's youth, which requires similar investment today. Now, if I was a, if I was a leader in, in an African country, what I would do is I would reach out to many Af uh, Chinese universities Partner them, up, partner them up with our own universities in, 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 in the country I'm in and look at the points of convergence. It goes beyond language and culture. It is about the practical aspects of the economy we are talking about. How do we train more engineers, agriculture experts, irrigation experts, you know, health workers, the entire ecosystem? I mean, I can imagine with the barefoot doctor culture that uh, China had, that is what gave China a lot of velocity in human capital. They were able to invest at the community level in health. This is precisely what Ruth just talked about. It's an Isiolo where Huawei, the UN, government of Kenya have come together on telemedicine. Imagine if we can go to scale with an army of technically savvy community health workers. We would change this entire ecosystem very, very quickly. Like I said, what took China 40 years to achieve? Africa can do it in 10. Why? Because we have the big data, we have the technology, and we have the innovation to do. I see great linkages over here where we could create this bedrock of skills 
through partnership of academic institutions, not just on the traditional degree, but more in the case of how to nurture and give velocity to the current economy and the future economy, which is the fourth industrial sector. So let's uh, go back to let's go back to your point, Sid. I I know for a fact that Alibaba has established a long-standing, robust educational programs to train e-commerce talents in Africa. Alibaba established its first the EWTP programs actually with uh, uh, Rwanda in Sub-Saharan Africa. Who are the other Chinese corporate players we're talking about that are setting up long-term agendas in training Africa's the digital talents for the future? I'm not, I, I don't have the answer to that, but I hope that it could be many, many more. I would like to see more public-private partnerships in the academic space. We have quite a few uh, tech companies, uh, in addition to Huawei, ZTE, yeah. uh, Heath Fission, Cloudwork, uh, but those have basically been providing services in terms of uh, e-governance platforms, data centers, surveillance systems. They have been more service providers uh, more than sort of training. Uh, although you could argue in the process of uh, providing um, service, they, they are also, there's a, a bit of a transfer of, of, of skills. Um, the support by... Um, is it called? Alibaba has really unlocked a lot of uh, and people and um, those who are doing startups uh, in, in, in the tech, tech industry. And what was exciting about that is the, the empowerment uh, small startups uh, in in the technology space. Uh, yeah. I think Alibaba is part of the exception. In that is the only one that has put, kind of put resources to support startups. The others, the transfer of technology is much less direct. Yeah, so, so, the demand is there. The demand is there. The supply is not there. We need a right. we need a supply of energy. And that can come when we see real public-private partnerships in the fold, where the government provides the enabling environment for the private sector and the public sector to unite in terms of providing those. So, uh, yeah, also, Shelley, if I may add some information about this, uh, uh, this training programs, there are also lots of Chinese private companies. Uh, who already started to do e-commerce with the African side, they are also doing this kind of startup training. They put a, they, they, they build up the platform and then train African either students from our side already studying in China, but also working in African countries. So uh, I know one company called Amembo. They are doing very well. They started in Kenya, but now already um, expanded to 17 African countries. It's really helping with, you know, uh, without any resource, any air capital, but as African youth, as long as you like right. this technology, you can just uh, work from zero to work with the, this company as they are one of their brand. Yeah. We don't, so right, we don't have a lot of time. Right, we don't have a yeah. lot of time, but it's really interesting. So Haifon and Ruthie are talking about basically lots and lots of on-the-job training by the Chinese digital companies. However, I do want to ask you a question though, Ruth. Uh, in Africa's development model going to the future, so Africa certainly will develop a vibrant agricultural economy, the primary industry. And now with China's a massive uh, digital transformation there, Africa will develop a vibrant digital economy, the service economy. But what's missing is the big part in the middle, the industrial economy, the secondary industry. You know, in China, 1978, when China started reform and opening up, China developed a very strong industrial base and therefore the world's factory. I do not see a future strong Africa just with the strong primary industry and the strong service economy. What are you going to do to the middle? Uh, that's a good question, Charlie, um, because uh, again, COVID has been an eye opener in more ways than one. Uh, when the supply chains were disrupted, um, you know, countries had to become self-reliant. 
victims reorganized themselves and began to provide uh, protective equipment for COVID. And overnight, we became, Kenya became not just uh, in uh, to, to, to the rest of the region, just you know, sort of with the turn of a pin, so to speak. Um, so I think that space needs to be expanded. Um, you know, data indicates that um, unless we can strengthen local manufacturing as opposed to just importing, get the jobs to, to the scale that is required. So a critical part of this conversation has to be how to have local manufacturing within the continent instead of simply importing uh, materials. And the two opportunities that are immediately available and where there's a lot of demand is in agro-processing and in pharmaceuticals. Mm. So, Kelly, if uh, I may also add something, some changes from Chinese side, the governmental scholarship has a new uh, uh, changes, which is really encourage uh, the manufacturing companies to work with the universities to, from the beginning, systematically training those human resources. So this is a, a latest, uh, I think since 2018, when the summit announced that there's a big number, so the ministry realized that there is a gap, as uh, we already discussed so much between uh, empl employment and uh, uh, the trainings. Uh, even when you train so many people, not necessarily immediately translated into human resource. So all the trainers need trainees need to from the beginning understand uh, industry, understand the companies. So this program has been helping us to solve that gap. And I also say Chinese uh, uh, private uh, self funded um, uh, training academy established in Kenya. No, sorry, in Uganda, are called the Sunmaker. Of course, initially they targeted uh, the oil companies to train the local people. Sure. But uh, by and by, they expanded to many different kinds of industries. And then this company also started to work in South Sudan, in Kenya, in Ethiopia. So you can see even Chinese private company can do a lot for training so for the industry, you know, to build up the capacity. We discussed a lot about uh, uh, education for the practical economic reasons for employment. However, we cannot avoid one last question, which is China's soft power. Uh, the United States has been um, extraordinary in terms of building its global soft power by training the future global leaders for generations. And China now is starting to emulate the same. I want to ask everybody a question. By 2050, 30 years down the road, when the next generation of leadership that are running countries in Africa, they have received a Chinese education, will that bring Africa closer to China? Will they be more affiliated with China? The answer is absolutely yes from my side. And I think the greatest contribution any nation can make to another is in its education system. Take the example of South Korea. You know, they benefited hugely from having access to top universities, technical universities in, in the US and vice versa. I see those opportunities here, but we have to keep in mind surely the scale that we need. When you're looking at a, in Kenya alone, uh, you know, you are you are, you have about one million young people joining the workforce every year. One million. Now, in order to train and equip them, you can't bring everybody to China, but you can bring China to Africa. And the greatest way to bring it is by opening up opportunities, both of digital education and on-site education opportunities. This would be a remarkable, a remarkable contribution towards the human capital investment that we need to make. And I just want to say that, that you know, you talked about agriculture. In the next nine years, agribusiness in Africa is going to be one trillion dollars worth. One trillion dollars. And yet Africa is a continent that loses 50% of its food to post-harvest law. Look at the opportunities that we have, both in the space of agriculture, and we've talked about pharmaceuticals, 
We've already done an assessment in Kenya about the potential of that in Africa. $400 billion, billion dollars over the next nine years. Massive opportunities, but it is about bringing the skills, the knowledge, and the expertise to Africa. Back to you. Um, yes, um, building on what uh, Sid said, I think for me, a simple answer is that the countries that will have the greatest influence in Africa today are those that were able to meet Africa at its point of need. Whether it is point of need in terms of job creation, whether it is point of need in terms of infrastructure, whether it is point of need in terms of health, whatever it is. So it is really a question of being constantly in tune with the emerging needs because these are evolving needs. Um, the, with the evolving needs of the continent and to support the continent where it, the shoe most bites. Mm, a friend in need is a friend indeed. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And, and that, oh. that is actually becoming more clear, you know, people are becoming much more transactional as opposed to ideological, if, if you see what I mean. Very interesting, but we are becoming more of a utilitarian world, in other words. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> Uh, Shelley, if I may also conclude uh, to answer your question, I think uh, I don't want to predict uh, for 30 years after what exactly China, you, we as U.S. who gain more in terms of a uh, softer power through this youth training program, but I do know that my colleagues within the Ministry of Education and also different universities, the people are doing lots of the jobs. For instance, my colleague from ministry, they are evaluate, they already, of course, each year there are all evaluation system, um, but they are also so-called, uh, for me, um, intensive evaluation, trying to improve the qualities. Now quality becoming a key word for training African youth. So I am, I'm, am in the way to be very optimistic about uh, we will have a very good um, you know, education program nowadays for Africa and we are learning and then still of course uh, in that way, maybe we have a brighter future, at least to serve what uh, Ruth emphasized, uh, this kind of evolving need can be meet, can be meet up uh, from Chinese side in, um, in a certain uh, degree. Absolutely. Fascinating conversation. China is so, given the old context, is still a young economy and African, the African continent is certainly the emerging economy. And so here we're talking about the two young economies two regions are trying to learn and grow with each other thank you so much for everyone's time miss ruth kagia uh, deputy chief of staff for the president of kenya Siddharth chatterjee u.n resident coordinator and uh, professor haifang liu from peking university thank you so much thank you thank you thank you, thank you very much
greatly honored to have uh, Mr. Jing Donghua, Vice President and Treasurer of the World Bank for a special fireside chat on Africa's future in global development. Jing Dong, you're a Chinese, I hope you don't mind me mentioning, who has been brought to the center of the global multilateral platform, but also your career happened to start with the African Development Bank. So what have you seen over the past decades through your multilateral career about transformation in Africa? Professor Yu, uh, thank you so much for the invitation and I'm honored to join you to share some of the, uh, the work that we do, both in China but also in Africa, and share some of my perspective. Indeed, uh, I happen to, to have some say in a topic like China and Africa, because uh, you know the first uh, uh, almost 30 years of my life I spent in China, you know my childhood, my formative years, but then I started my international career uh, in Africa, uh, lived for three and a half years, and then later when I joined the IC, I certainly visited Africa more than any other continent. So it's it's a continent where I have a lot of affinity and passion about. Now, uh, just very broadly speaking, uh, uh, first of all, you know, uh, as the World Bank just celebrated 40 years of relationship with China, we certainly can say that China has been an outstanding success when it comes to development. Uh, you know, from the time that China opened up in 1978, uh, you know, China has, uh, has had a, a tremendous uh, achievement. And in that uh, journey, the World Bank is very happy to be a to be a very uh, supportive partner you know i just got this information i just wanted to mention that we uh, in the last 40 years we have invested in over 430 projects in china with a total amount of uh, 64 billion dollars mm. and certainly uh witnessing and supporting china's uh, uh you know development plan so from a poor country to a higher middle income country and continue to grow, it's certainly uh, a, a, a model where we can draw a lot of lessons, including for Africa. Now, when it, when it comes to Africa, you know, the way I look at it is that I can tell you about, uh, you know, from two sides. One is anecdotal. The other is, is what we can see from the World Bank side. Anecdotally, you know, I, I, I work in, uh, in Africa in the early 1990s. And at that time, China was still in the early journey of development. And Africa was actually trying to go beyond civil conflict. Uh, as a matter of fact, when I was living in Africa, many countries were in civil conflict or regional war. I can mention, you know, I lived in Abidjan. This was 1993 and 1994, uh, all the way till 1997. You know, you have wars in Liberia, in Sierra Leone, in Angola, mm -hmm. in Mozambique, and then you have regional conflict in Ethiopia, Eritrea, and of course, uh, the very, very unfortunate genocide in uh, Rwanda and, and in Burundi. So, so if you put, you know, the development journey in that context, Africa had only started to focus on development at a later stage than China, mm -hmm. right? But, you know, I'm happy to, to see that uh, uh, in the last decade, you know, Africa continent, you know, if you look at uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, which has 48 countries, the vast majority of countries have been making progress. They are peaceful. They have turned their attention to development, right? But of course, you know, it's 48 very different countries with their own culture, history, so on and so forth. Um, so I think it's a journey that we are traveling. But here, let me also turn in institutional. That is, what are the successful factors that China did that could be of relevance to Africa, right? So let, let me quickly mention four areas and maybe we can expand a little uh, uh, further in later Q and A's. But the first is that China's early decision to open the country up to trade to take advantage of the, the, the vast pool of labor, right? To do manufacturing, to export, to earn foreign exchange, and then turn it into uh, resources to finance China's development, right? So that is something that China did very well. Africa, uh, you know, recently has launched a continental free trade agreement, which means that 
within Africa region, trade will be, you know, uh, will be much easier to be facilitated. I think that's actually a great momentum, uh, and, and, and certainly the World Bank and many other international organizations are helping. But that is a, 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 a that leads to a second issue that is infrastructure, right? Including, you know, roads, uh, transport, ports, uh, telecommunications, so on and so forth. The fact that for a long time it is cheaper to ship something from Shanghai to Mombasa, which is the port city of Kenya, then it is then take that container from Mombasa to an inland country like Rwanda and Burundi. That really speaks volume about the urgent need for Africa itself to build infrastructure so that the trade can be facilitated, right? Now, what is the difficulty? Uh, you know, a lot of people, when I mentioned the following, really don't get the concept. I said, you know, the map doesn't do Africa justice, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's a northern perspective of the world. The actual size of the Africa continent how big is it? Well, I tell people, if you drop the United States into Africa, you drop Canada into Africa, then you drop into China into Africa, Africa continent is still bigger than the three countries added together. So you could appreciate the vast landscape and the expense and, uh, you know, to build infrastructure. But nevertheless, that said, it is a big priority, right? To, for Africa to take advantage of its natural resources, its labor force for manufacturing, so on and so forth. So this is the this is the second. The third, I think China did very well, and I was a beneficiary, is that China focused a lot on basic education, basic health care, right? So so you know, when I was growing up, you know, education is very much emphasized uh, because that's actually a foundational piece in terms of of giving people the knowledge, giving people the skills to participate in a productive uh, 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 you know, development. And, and, and therefore, the World Bank actually spends a lot of its uh, 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 partnership with Africa on education, on um, you know, healthcare, so on and so forth. The last thing I wanted to mention is financial market. That is, for development to happen, you really need the financing. And, you know, all of the international development assistance, whether it's from the World Bank, African Union Bank, from AIIB, added together is a very tiny part that is needed, right? Mm -hmm. In the case of China, China eventually developed the second largest financial market in the world after the United States, right? So China's bond market is now $15 trillion. China's equity market is 10 trillion. So when you develop a vibrant financial market, you then have an efficient way to recycle your domestic savings and grow that domestic savings as a primary source of development financing. So these are the four elements I like to mention. But let me just say, uh, you know, in concluding this first question, is that you know, when I, when I was in Africa uh, about 30 years ago, you travel around in Africa, when you go through an airport, sometimes you run into difficulty, right? Whether it's immigration customs or even the basic infrastructure of the airport itself. But now you, you travel to Africa, you go through, you know, immigration or, uh, or, or the border and you go through a, a very well, nicely built airport it's not different than going to other airports. It is one sign that Africa is progressing as the rest of the world is. So let me just stop there and uh, I'm happy to answer more questions. It's uh, no doubt that if we just open up the IMF statement, it says that, well, Sub-Saharan Africa has uh, the five of the world's poorest countries. I think that is just factual, but also uh, Sub-Saharan Africa has the world's today fastest the growing economies so such as Rwanda. So what are some of the other exciting things that are happening in that particular region that you think that the world should know, but don't really talk much about? Early, one of my last trips to Africa uh, uh, was really focused uh, on FinTech, right? How we can use FinTech 
to leapfrog some of the you know, infrastructure needs. But before we talk about that, let, let's say that this COVID-19 really has, has, uh, you know, has um, posed a global challenge. Mm. Uh, and, and it really highlighted some of the challenges of basic infrastructure. For example, in the United States, in Europe, where you live, uh, even if kids have to stay home, they do have broadband so that they can still you know, be able to log on to go to school, but where in Africa and many other developing countries, you know, kids just are left at home and, and, and they have no access to education capability. So how do you make sure you have Wi-Fi, you have you know, cellular technology, you have telecommunication infrastructure so that people can benefit from, from, from you know, uh, uh, the ability, even in under challenging situations, they can still function as a society. This actually give us, you know, new hope that we can address this right now. But that said, so, so our immediate focus right now in the World Bank and broader global uh, development community is how to help Africa to rebuild Africa post COVID-19, address the healthcare needs, address education, nutrition, women's health, reproductive health, you know, a lot of things that is immediate. And then of course, climate change, infrastructure, and many other things, uh, private entrepreneurship, so on and so forth. But let me mention two things that I think are exciting. You're absolutely correct. Africa still has some of the poorest countries in the world due to very unfortunate internal civil conflict, wars, terrorism, lack of uh, you know, funding, so on and so forth. But you also mentioned some great successes in terms of, um, of uh, uh, including Rwanda from a country that suffered genocide to one of the most vibrant economies in, in Africa. Uh, so in, 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 in that uh, uh, aspect, you know, Rwanda actual parliament that is more than half of their parliamentarians are women. They really have made tremendous program in social development, right? Making sure every citizen, including a full participants in decision-making, in national policy formulation, and in being pro productive, you know, uh, uh, entrepreneurs, workers, and in the society, right? But importantly, that, you know, when I mentioned the sort of cell phone, it's actually in Kenya. It is because Kenya over a decade ago, you know, somehow enabled a cell phone based financial inclusion strategy. Therefore, every citizen in Kenya was able to access financial services. So therefore, you know, before uh, M-Pesa, which is the name of the Kenya, uh, you know, FinTech uh, or, or FinTech platform, you know, only about 10% of Venus is over now, and they have made tremendous progress. So these are exciting role modeling of other African countries, right? Because, you know, when you talk about China, Korea, they are too far. But if you say my neighboring country, wow, if Kenyans can have access to finance, take advantage of leapfrogging using technology, you know, if I'm another country in Africa, uh, they will be motivated more. So we at the World Bank, we very much are working with them to use new technology to help Africa to leapfrog. I remember a couple of months ago, I happened to have this conversation with a Nobel economist, uh, Mike Spence. And so Mike said, post the COVID-19, going back to your question, Jingdo, that uh, Africa almost certainly have to resort to a heavy investment-led economic growth model. So countries either have to borrow a lot or suffer a lot. But if countries do borrow a lot, from the World Bank's perspective and from your personal experience, how do African countries ensure that economic sustainability and the fiscal resilience? Uh, surely that's a great question. So the way development finance has evolved, uh, 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 maybe we need to take a step back, right? So in the, you know, just post World War II, I think at that time, it was simply uh, rebuilding, you know, if you give money to build road, bridges, factories, 
good things will happen, right? From that very simple concept of development to now a human-centric sustainable development at the center of, uh, of, the, of the development agenda, it's a tremendous uh, evolution, right? So the way we work with African continent is that we actually, every couple of years, we sit down with the government, we figure out jointly what is the best strategy and what, depending on the country's background, its natural endowment of resources and its uh, current situation. So we have a, what we call a very comprehensive country partnership strategy, okay? So it's a partnership. It's not a relationship of we tell you what to do, right? Because we already have seven decades of development experience. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. We learn from successes, we learn from mistakes, and we share with the country those development experiences that based on the country's uh, uh, specific experiences, let's figure out, okay, the World Bank, what is the angle we can better help you? What are the things that you can work with other partners, so and so forth? So first of all, the development plan is country driven. Second is indeed that sustainability is critically important, right? Because you don't want a situation where you pile up foreign debt, where the country cannot absorb, but then later became a burden on the country. So therefore, I think the World Bank actually uh, raised this issue uh, two years ago and, and, and was then uh, 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 you know, certainly endorsed by the G20 in terms of, and this is because of the urgent situation under COVID, right? That how do we then fundamentally resolve the debt sustainability issue? However, debt is not all bad, right? Because when you are developing in the process of development, you need financing, you need, uh, especially when your domestic financial resources are not sufficient, you need uh, investment from other countries, of course, naturally in foreign currencies to come in. Our job is really to make sure on one hand, are those projects tangible? Would they produce a positive economic financial result, but equally important positive impact on society, um, on the country, right? So that sustainability goes into our analytical framework in working with the country. But of course, we have to address the legacy issues that those that already accumulated, unfortunately, because of factors not caused by the countries themselves, for example, commodity super cycle, where a country relies on commodity exports to, to have a steady revenue, all of a sudden, you know, commodity prices collapsed and they lost an important source of revenue and, and therefore they fell into a debt uh, 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 a liability issue. So we have to address the outstanding debt sustainability issue, but equally or even more importantly, going forward, we have to make sure that when we design financing, how do we make sure going forward, the country will not fall back into uh, uh, indebtedness that would not sustain a positive outcome. Well, the World Bank has been a leading example in delivering uh, development uh, sustainable goals in Africa, as well as uh, other countries in the world. But today, I must say, though, Jingzhou, the World Bank is no longer the only one that are talking about partnerships, so especially financing partnerships with Africa. So since 2013, we have seen a wave of uh, multilateral institutions that are developed uh, out of China. It, you have just mentioned about the AIIB and the New Development Bank, who are going to be at our conference uh, joining you as well, but also Chinese uh, development banks as well. Post the COVID-19, China single-handedly held 20% of Africa's total debt. And so will that percentage, you think, continue to grow out of China's balance sheet? And do they come into competition in Africa with the uh, Brenton Woods institutions such as yours? Well, surely I have been very fortunate myself. I work in five different international multilateral uh, development institutions. So certainly I'm thrilled to see more institutions are created to address the, the critical needs of development finance in a multilateral fashion, right? So having worked in multilateral system for the past 30 years, I very much appreciate because multilateral 
institutions do represent the broadest consensus in terms of what needs to be done in development. What are the priorities, right? From building a policy framework that is sustainable, brings the country into transparency, uh, 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 you know, zero tolerance of corruption, because these will build trust, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and then, of course, uh, making sure that sufficient financing goes into the country. The sad reality is that if you add up, you know, AI, B New Development Bank, us, African Indian Bank, the total financial investment we can make is a drop in a bucket in the needs of Africa, right? Therefore, I actually, we very much welcome uh, Mr. Jin Li Chin, the president of uh, AIB. Uh, certainly, uh, he was my boss uh, when, I was, when we were working in the Asian Indian Bank together, and I certainly have learned a lot from him. And, uh, uh, and, and uh, AIIB, even before its, uh, its uh, formal launch, had a lot of interaction with the World Bank. And I'm very happy to, to, to say that that partnership, in terms of sharing our experiences in institution formation, in sharing our successes or lessons learned, so on and so forth, I hope that had benefited uh, um, the, the creation of uh, AIIB and New Development Bank. Not to mention quite a number of senior staff from New Development Bank and AIIB came from the World Bank, came from other multilateral institutions. And we have done a lot of projects together. So let me just use one example to showcase the tremendous partnership we have done. So between the World Bank and AIIB, we actually did a great investment in Rwanda to support you know, increased credit to micro, small, medium-sized enterprises. The way it is done is that AIIB provided $100 million loan. And then the World Bank used our item, which is highly concessional uh, resources to blend in the cost. So the, the total cost in interest savings over the life of the loan for the clients is 18 basis points. It may be a small number, it adds up, right? And certainly that's a, one of many things we have done together. So, so I we certainly welcome you know, the creation of new multilateral institutions. And we believe we play a, a, a big role in this. And the World Bank has been, if I may say, uh, uh, very generous in sharing our knowledge, sharing our policy, uh, sharing our experiences with the new development institutions. And I call Mr. Jin, you know, my elder and, and uh, Leslie, who is a good friend of mine, who is, uh, you know, the CFO of uh, New Development Bank. We are a small circle. And, and let me say again, the total resources of ODA, Official Development Assistance, is so small compared with the needs of development, right? So there is no competition. It's only partnership and working together and hopefully using our limited resources, not as a direct investment, but to build a investment climate so that billions and trillions of private investment will go to Africa and go to other developing countries. That's really our goal. That is so indeed encouraging to hear that there is such a strong and trusting sense of collaboration across the institutions. But uh, Jingzhou, when uh, talking with your colleagues earlier, two words really got stuck in my mind. One is your colleagues say, well, Jingzhou is a true multilateral guy. You believe in multilateralism. And the second word I heard is that you are pro-innovation. I think you are not only pro-innovation in African countries, such as Rwanda, you are actually pro-innovation in designing the World Bank products, financial products at the frontier of global development. However, I must say, though, the World Bank today is 75 years old, and it itself as an institution needs reform and innovation. I know you have a huge responsibility. What is on your agenda currently to ensure that the World Bank itself as an institution can ensure that the sustainability and resilience as well. We have been given a, a leading role in terms of not only to make sure ourselves, right? The World Bank recently said over a third of our direct financing must be climate. Okay, that's a tremendous commitment, right? And we are we are we are very much. But how do we then use our project as role model so that it can be replicated as best practices? 
to quality and private sector investment so that that goal of trillion dollars every year gets achieved. So I think although we are 75, we feel very young. Now, on the finance side, look, the World Bank uh, introduced the first swap transaction in the world. We issued the world's first global bond. We issued the first world's first green bond. We issued the world's first blockchain bond. And we, this year, actually helped UNICEF to tap the power of capital market. The World Bank issued a bond where part of the proceed goes to UNICEF, backed up by the private donation to UNICEF. And, and, and that's really, really wonderful. Uh, so we stay on the cutting edge of finance, not for the sake of innovation itself, but to constantly find ways to introduce attractive solutions, good for the country, but also uh, attractive enough for the vast pool of savings. A biggest example I want to give you is what we call cat bond, catastrophe bond, right? So very simply, if I'm a finance minister of a country and I tell the infrastructure minister that this year I'll give you 100 million in my local currency, you go build some roads, right? And then unfortunately an earthquake or a typhoon hits the country. You know, if you don't have insurance, what happens is that I will have to call the infra minister and say, sorry, the 100 million I've given to you, I need to take it back because now that money has to go to uh, you know, humanitarian assistance to our citizens, right? Now, what have we done, the World Bank? We have introduced catastrophe bonds to help countries to uh, mitigate those unexpected events, right? In Latin America, we have issued head bonds for quite a number of countries, several billion dollars. Recently, we helped Jamaica to do a bond, uh, $180 million for two or three cyclone seasons. In the sense that when cyclone hits, right, uh, and, and, and it's what we call parametric, meaning that if it hits certain uh, uh, level, there is an automatic payout to the country. So that instead of taking back the, the money building infrastructure, there is money from bond investors that will go to the country. So these are wonderful innovation you know, hopefully one day will, 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 you know, significantly increase private sector's participation. Now you would wonder why a private sector uh, investor would buy a catastrophe bond where they could lose money. Well, for two reasons. Number one, of course, the insurance premium, which is a coupon of the bond, is much higher than a triple A rated World Bank bond. That pays very little because of, so you get an extra yield, right? That normally you wouldn't have. The second is a cat bond is not correlated to the behavior of regular fixed income bond. It's not driven by, you know, the Federal Reserve's announcement or inflation number. Therefore, uh, you know, surely you're an economics professor, it achieves great diversification effect. Mm -hmm. so, so, you know, this is very exciting as a treasurer of the World Bank that we use innovation uh, uh, to scale up finance. So with that, Shirley, I hope uh, I don't look 75 years old. In any event, you know, uh, the 75 is the new 30 years old. We are in our prime. Jingdong, I cannot let you go without asking a question on behalf of our brilliant students at the LSC. I'm sure many students, they would aspire to have a career like yours. What are the essential skills do you recommend in order to meet the challenges of future global development? Well, thank you. And certainly my best wishes to your students. Uh, you know, the first answer is that being at S, uh, LSE itself is a great start to go into development, right? Because it's a, it's, a, it's a prestigious institution. It sits in London, which is one of the most important global financial centers. Uh, and look, I mean, it's very simple. Um, uh, you, you, you need to have a passion for development. Um, and uh, that passion then should drive you to learn a, a field that you find interesting, right? Whether it's, it's economics, health, healthcare, agriculture, you know, climate change, so on and so forth. Because you need to start using expertise, right? As an angle 
to help uh, because the World Bank, like all the other multilateral banks, we address virtually all the SDG goals, right? With with the ultimate goal of eradicating poverty and build a common prosperity for, for humanity. So, so having passion, find an areas of expertise as a starting point. Well, of course, uh, while you are pursuing your academic study, find opportunities to do internship at uh, you know institutions like the World Bank, the United Nations, the IIB, New Development Bank, and watch out for uh, watch our uh, websites and and uh, you know I think uh, I would urge you to to read our president's speeches because that actually is very important in terms of uh, where the international development thinkings are and uh, watch our vacancy postings and, and apply for jobs right. And if you get turned down once or twice, don't be discouraged. We are very fortunate for every position we open. We do have many, uh, uh, many motivated candidates. But I think if you keep trying and uh, meanwhile, accumulate experiences, uh, you are getting it. Accidentally, I heard that, uh, you know, you actually wasn't selected for the first time when you were applying for a World Bank job. I didn't even get a reply. And uh, instead, I started as a young professional in African Union Bank. And therefore, look, I mean, it really, actually, that's a great, um, a great, a great way really to say, it really doesn't matter where you start. If you have a passion, you want to achieve something, eventually, you will be able to achieve it. You will get there. Journey in that context. Africa had only started to focus on development at a later stage than China, right? But, you know, I'm happy to, to see that I didn't even get a reply. And uh, instead, I started as a young professional in African Union Bank. And therefore... You will get there. Thank you so much, Jing Donghua, Vice President and Treasurer of the World Bank. We thank you so much for your time. You're welcome. Thank you. Greatly honored to have
fans, patrons, alums, and the supporters from all over the world. Thank you so much for tuning in to China Africa Conference 2021. My name is Shirley Yu, new director of the China Africa Initiative at the Faroj Lodge Institute for Africa at the London School of Economics. On behalf of Professor Tim Allen, the director of the Faroj Lodge Institute for Africa at the London School of Economics, we welcome distinguished global dignitaries and leading stakeholders on China and Africa, the two most important emerging economies in the 21st century. We come together to share insights and global debates about this quintessential global transformation that are happening in the global economic growth engine for the 21st century, that is China, and the global economic growth engine for the 22nd century in Africa. Much is underdiscovered and maybe even misunderstood by the wider world. So today at the center of London, we want to bring global ideas together. We want to share different perspectives. So we want to understand not only across centuries of development models from the 19th century UK to the 20th century United States, 21st century China, and 22nd century Africa. We want to bridge understanding across the world's geographical regions. We want to understand China today and other parts of the emerging markets, especially in Africa. And we want to understand how Africa is going to upgrade its agricultural industry, is going to build a burgeoning industrial economy, how to transform itself into 21st century digital economy. We all have a stake in Africa's future prosperity and on the spaces, let's come together and let's make London once again, the global hub for ideas for the emerging world. Welcome to the China Africa Conference 2021 at the London School of Economics on September 28th, sponsored by the Faroj Lodge Institute for Africa. Please subscribe to this YouTube channel where we will be live streaming some of our conference programs and also our ongoing programs on China and Africa. Join us, support us. Shirley, I think you were muted. Welcome, Professor Chen, Dr. Moyu, and my colleague, Lawrence Etiolasi. We are just about a minute into our live stream into this, uh, what I consider the most exciting part of our day, the grand finale here. Uh, nothing seems to be as exciting as um, when we move into politics, right? And particularly with two amazing thinkers and the most eloquent orator, I think uh, that um, on China-Africa topics uh, on the global stage. And so we are truly honored to have uh, both gentlemen joining us today. So if we may just to, uh, get started, uh, we have been uh, going through this live stream uh, for a whole day. We covered uh, many topics uh, in Per perhaps most of the topics you would consider very soft. We went from investment uh, to uh, trade, to education, to sustainability, and now we are finally moving into some hardcore, exciting issues here. That is China, is it a friend or a foe? I remember many years ago as uh, former Australian Prime Minister Tony Abbott used to say, hey, uh, China is our frenemy. What is a frenemy? Well, Australians are great at coining words. Uh, so today, a friend or not a friend, I guess that is the question we're trying to debate here. So joining us today, again, are uh, two really most passionate and eloquent thinkers uh, that uh, we are so honored to, to have um, on China and Africa. Professor Stephen Chan, Chair Professor in World Politics and the Foundation Dean of Law in the Social Sciences at SOAT, University of London. I must say though, uh, Professor Chen, uh, we have been getting a, a rising number of social media hits from SOAT. So thank you for bringing the web traffic to us, to the LSC. And uh, Dr. Mo Yu, politician and economist, 
former minister of uh, industry and of, uh, Zimbabwe. I know you are uh, you were with us uh, in the morning session, and uh, actually that session happened to get the highest number of comments on our social media so far as well. So uh, indeed, we are just uh, coming to the highlight of the day here, and I'm very honored to have my colleague Lawrence Redford, managing director of the China Africa blog at the LSC, to be my co-moderator here. We have uh, two strong debaters, so <laughs> it's always safe to have a, uh, a strong hand next to me. So uh, a quick commercial here. For anyone who's uh, tuning, in, tuning in to our live stream now, please uh, uh, search for uh, Professor Stephen Chen and Dr. Nosana Moyu on your social media accounts. Follow them. But uh, at the same time, uh, do search out uh, China Africa blog at the LSC and uh, follow us as well. Um, I don't think Professor Chen and Dr. Moyu, you two need a moderator really to start a debate. I understand that you debate with each other with or with the moderator anyhow. So I guess uh, we will set back and uh, just let you take off and I will taper down the temperature when it gets too hot, I guess. So why don't we uh, start with uh, both of you. Lawrence was checking with me earlier, say, where do they stand on this issue? I said, I have no idea. So why don't we just uh, give you two the opportunity to tell the world what do you think about this issue? And maybe um, because Professor Chen uh, is your first time and since you are so popular <laughs> with our SOAS audience, uh, why don't we uh, start with you first? Well, I'm very, very happy uh, to start. And I want to thank you. And I'm very, very impressed that LSC has undertaken this initiative. We, we regard SOAS and LSE as sister institutions. So it's only natural that our students would want to participate in what you've put together. So. Thank you for making this available. And Nikosana and I have known each other for many years, and we have, in fact, shared platforms before on the China-Africa issue. On the question, China, is it a friend or a foe? Well, I think that China wants to be a friend, but it's been rather clumsy and not always very skillful in its friendship. But it's tried to be a friend for many, many long years. And I think this really emanates as far back as the 1955 Bandung Conference, when the then Chinese Prime Minister, Zhao Enlai, went to Bandung and basically declared that China was going to help the emerging world and do so without conditions, and also do so without interference. Now, to a certain extent, China has lived up to that promise, but it hasn't always understood very well the emerging world. It hasn't fully understood Africa. When I first started going to China uh, some years ago, working on China-Africa issues, uh, negotiating on the side of African delegations, I discovered two things. A, they were astounded that a Chinese person would be negotiating with the Africans. And B, the state of their data, the state of their information was at that stage, we're talking about 15 years ago now, I thought extremely primitive. It wasn't well developed. All of their researchers were towing a party line. In other words, those who were making decisions were getting to hear what they wanted to hear. And that was China was nothing but of benefit to Africa. It's only in more recent days, particularly in my experience with the State Council of the Chinese Prime Minister, you're getting to have what I would regard as nuanced and sophisticated information. But this means that you've had for many, many years Chinese making policy towards Africa that has not been what you and I would regard as fully formed in terms of basic information feeds. And so a lot of clumsiness and also a lot of residue still from the Cold War when Africa was seen very, very much as something which had to be gotten on side. The terrible Chinese mistakes in taking military sides in Angola simply because the Russians were taking another side and choosing the side that the Russians weren't on, and then choosing a wrong side, uh, was very, very much evidence of a certain kind of naivety. At the same time, they've been very instrumental in helping liberation movements. My famous story when I was assigned to the 1980 Zimbabwe independence elections, liaising at Lieutenant Colonel level, not that I was Lieutenant Colonel, I kind of jumped up uh, liaison rank pronto so I could do this. But Mugabe's lieutenant colonel, seeing that I was Chinese, immediately pulled out of their webbing chopsticks, saying, we're going to feed you tonight Chinese style, because we were taught in Tanzania by Chinese instructors who also introduced us to the cuisine. And they had nothing but good words for the help that China gave. 
in their words, because you people helped us when no one else would. And that kind of legacy has remained, so that there's still an awful lot of Chinese feed into Zimbabwe. China's helped keep Zimbabwe pretty much afloat with a whole range of project-related investments, but still bringing money into the country. Similarly, the controversy around Sudan for so many years had refused to criticize President Bashir, even while the atrocities of Darfur uh, were underway, until finally uh, they put in a lot of heavyweight intervention. But that's because Sudan was the fourth country in Africa to offer China diplomatic recognition yeah. when China was a diplomatic pariah. So the Chinese remember the debts from the old days. However, they can be extremely clumsy in terms of their overtures to Africa. Now, in part, I need to say that very often African delegations and African governments don't negotiate very well. There are some spectacular exceptions to this. I really rate what the Angolans and the Ethiopians are doing. They're negotiating with sophistication and nuance and pushback. Not everyone does that. So it was just released today that Zambia, a country that's very close to my heart, is 66 billion in debt, US billion in debt to China, twice the previous estimate. I'd be surprised if the Zimbabweans were not in debt more than that. And this is a picture of Chinese largesse, which comes with certain forms of conditionality, which one day have to be met. You've got to pay the piper. And notwithstanding the lack of capacity in, or the lack of will to negotiate on the part of many African governments, uh, what you've got is also, I think, a certain amount of license on the part of not so much the Chinese government these days, but with the permission of the Chinese government, Chinese banks and making available loan finance. And this has got to be something which has given a certain degree of, as it were, moderation and a certain degree of oversight. Certainly what the world can do is to try to enhance African negotiating capacity, but that's quite hard. You've got 55 different countries, remember, that's including Somaliland as a recognized country. Uh, so you've got, as it were, a friend or someone who tries to be a friend, who gets it very badly and clumsily wrong from time to time. But the other side of the friendship can sometimes still be naive, not helpless, not just open material for a new colonization. Those are lazy terms, much more sophisticated than that. But everybody's understanding and everybody's capacity to negotiate along very subtle lines on both sides that needs to be upgraded. Mm. Very interesting indeed. However, uh, Professor Chen, when you mentioned China's uh, clumsy friends, no matter how clumsy, you would still consider China a, 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 a friend. So uh, Dr. Moyu, what about your position? Thank you very much, Shelley. And uh, thanks, uh, Stephen. And yeah, Stephen has already put a, a context to our constant engagements on this particular issue. And I don't think I need to repeat the factual basis because I think we all probably know what the facts are. What is interesting for me is how we then interpret those facts. And when you put labels like friend or for, you are almost implying an intention in the actions that you perceive are happening. So, and my, I suppose my other sort of background comment would be that I rather, this is called a discussion rather than a debate, to be honest with you, because debate implies a, a pro and sort of a, and against, and I think we are going to have a conversation. My starting point is to acknowledge that for as long as the world at the moment is what the architecture of nation states, a government that is responsible for a country's first responsibility is to its citizens. Not to, and if we didn't like a President Trump when he put it very bluntly, but clumsily uh, to, to borrow a word here. But he was just telling us the truth that everybody does it, but maybe we nuance it, we are soft on how we put it, but he was very blunt and clumsy in just telling us bluntly that he was going to look after American interests first. Americans elected him. He was responsible for that country and not for any other country. And I think we need to have that as a backdrop. The Chinese government and the Chinese people 
look after their interests first. And that is their responsibility and their right. So is there anything that China has done, either historically or at present, where you can say, I see an evil intent behind what they do? I would be challenged to see, but I'm quite open to be pointed in the direction of where that evidence exists, because I don't have it myself. But does it mean that their, all their interventions are going to help the continent, the African continent? I think the answer is no, as the Prof has said already. There's going to be some damage. For me, however, the question that then arises is who is responsible for these outcomes or for allowing these actions to take place in the manner in which they take place in the first place? If China is responsible for China, I know we are using a country against 54, but we understand in the context of this conversation that when we say Africa, it's a collection of many countries. We are averaging out. We understand all of that. And let's not debate the fact that it's a country against 54. So we, on the African side, I think need to have agency. So if China comes and extends what is supposed to be a helping hand. And uh, yes, their knowledge or, firstly, their intention, we cannot question, or if we question, I would like us to debate that and get the evidence. But if we take it at their word that they want to help, the fact that they may not know how to help means we have got a responsibility to guide them in terms of us being clearer on what we want. If we were clear on what we want, mm. engaged with them, and pointed out to them that their manner of engagement is not appropriate, and then they resisted and insisted on a predetermined position, then we could have a conversation about, so what is the intention? But I think the problem we have is that there is no evidence from most African countries other than, I didn't realize that Angola is doing it. I know that Ethiopia has been very good at this having clarity on what it is they want from a development partner. And in fact, I would broaden this conversation and say, it does not matter whether it's China or America or the UK or France or Germany, the same dynamic is going to arise. If we are not capable of having clarity and laying out what our agenda is and what our priorities are and how we want to sequence things, who is responsible? Is it China or is it us? My own humble opinion is that we have to take ownership. And I would like it based on evidence that China has rejected such guidance from an African country, where an African country has had clarity and has put on the table what it is their wishes are, and then China has said, no, we're not going to do it that way. Let's have the evidence. I don't know it. So my inclination is to, for us to take ownership of this issue in this conversation to say the blame, if there is going to be any, is on our side, either because of corruption or lack of preparedness, not deploying the best resources we have. Part of, you know, sadly, part of this issue of putting patronage ahead of merit in the teams that we construct to go and engage. Who is to blame? Is it China? I don't think so. So my view is that China is neither an enemy or a foe. I mean, an enemy or a friend. China is, I think, available to use its resources to support our intentions, provided we can spell them out clearly enough. That's where I'll leave it. Mm. Very interestingly, uh, that's a very utilitarian way of looking at international relations, actually. Uh, Her Excellency Ruth Kagia, the Deputy Chief of Staff to the President of Kenya, just did a uh, panel session with us earlier, the session before us. She actually talked about uh, very similar views about this uh, return to real politics, and essentially uh, she said a friend in need is a friend indeed, and China is indeed there for Africa. So, I, I guess uh, here is more of a humanitarian question rather than a political science question. That is, if China brings the expertise, China brings the money, China brings the uh, the uh, the investment and the infrastructure, 
And then uh, Africa says, well, we need it. So, so China will welcome you to come in. Well, that's money on the table. But that's money build trust or friendship. But, but you know what, uh, uh, Shelley? If, if we don't take ownership of this issue, so I come from a banking background, if you want, if you've got a project and you come to me asking for a loan, you have to tell me what you want the money for. You just, I don't just give you money. You have to convince me what you want the money for because in that interaction, I want to see the viability of what it is you're going to do with the money so that you can pay me back. Because remember, as a financier, the money most of the time is not mine anyway. I have got a bit of capital on the line, but most of the money is either borrowed from markets or is my depositor's money. And therefore, what is at stake for me, the banker, is that you're going to pay me back. So I need to be convinced that you're going to, you have to justify. I don't have to tell you what you, I don't come saying, take this money and go away and do whatever you want with it. You have to convince me, you have to come up with a well thought out presentation of what you want to do with the money. And you can't just take the money and waste it and then blame me for having made that money available. Why did you take it? What were you going to do with it? No, I agree with that absolutely. I mean, just to extend the case of Zambia that I referred to a little bit uh, earlier, the Minister of Finance of the previous government, uh, Margaret Monatatwe, also had a banking uh, background. Uh, I knew her very well, and she was a very, very able uh, banker. But she had no real say in the final political decisions taken by President Lungu, who basically wanted quick fix solutions to a whole range of development problems. So he got a lot of infrastructure, but a huge cost of indebtedness. And the other experience which comes to mind was when I was addressing a private conference of the deputy governors of all the central banks in Africa, everyone involved with managing sovereign wealth funds. And the Namibian the director of their sovereign wealth fund ambushed me and said, can you please look at this deal we've just signed with the Chinese for platinum uh, expropriation? And I looked at it, and my face must have turned white. She said, is it that bad? And I said, you've been screwed. And she said, yes, I know that too. But our president, this was in the days before President Geinkopf, said we had to sign it off for political reasons. So you've got, as it were, a two-level problem. Often there's extremely good expertise, technocratic expertise, uh, at the level just below the highest political level. But you've got political agendas which are not often at the very highest levels well thought out. So there's a real problem here in terms mm. of a match between capacity, which is often there, and political willingness, which is often determined to go ahead in a way which is dangerous for the future, and debt basically accumulates. So trying to sort that out is not just down to a simple rubric that says capacity development. And that, again, I think is reductionist and very, very naive. It's level of capacity, deployment of that, and the interaction between political policy and political driving forces and the technocratic capacity and that is there. Once you've got that marriage right, and that's why I singled out the Ethiopians. I think that, for instance, the minister in the prime minister's office in Ethiopia, uh, Akebe Akube, uh, who incidentally is a SOAS PhD, I have to get that plug in there somewhere, has a good relationship with the prime minister and with his predecessors because he was also the mayor of Addis Ababa. When you've got that kind of synergy between skill, and political vision, uh, one can moderate the other. And I think that's what's required, not just something simple that says capacity uh, or sort of uh, lack of naivety. It's a more complex picture than that. Africa is developing very rapidly, so these contradictions between political drive and policy technocratic capacity, those contradictions are going to become more and more present in the picture, particularly when you're dealing with complex relationships and the Chinese relationship is a very complex one. In fact, Stephen, you are mm, absolutely right. So it's a Another compound. So let, me give you, so let me give you an example. I mean, I, I once asked a, a Chinese friend, 
why it was that China appeared to have a problem channeling resources to the private sector directly rather than to the public sector. And I got a very interesting answer, and that speaks to part of what Professor Chan has just highlighted. The Chinese have got a certain way of governing themselves. And unsurprisingly, that therefore, their interaction with Africa is based on their own model of how they govern themselves. And we on the African continent are tending to the Western world in terms of how we govern ourselves, i.e. there is a private sector and there is a public sector where the one cannot dictate. It can regulate and make policy and so on, but by and large, the private sector in the Western world does its own thing. Whereas my understanding, and please correct me if I'm wrong, there is a much better alignment from almost like a national agenda perspective between the public and the private sector in China. At least that's what I perceive. And in many ways, almost a hierarchy, mm. not just an alignment, but a hierarchy. And so the answer I got was an interesting right. one. The answer was that the Chinese make an assumption that at the, the apex of a society is government. And the government is responsible for looking after the welfare of its citizens. And so if you are wanting sure. to assist a country, what makes sense for the Chinese is that the resources go to the government and the government has got the know-how at the domestic level where the money should go, where the resources should go, private, public, or whatever. Now, once I got this explanation, it became clear to me that what the, how they were managing this inter intervention made sense because of their way of operating. So it's up to us to understand where they are coming from. And if our governments are irresponsible, in terms of how they then manage the allocation of those resources, it cannot be blamed on the Chinese. <laughs> They've made the resources available to the highest authority in their opinion for that authority to then decide how to distribute the resources. So one has to be, again, these nuances of how you negotiate, but starting off with understanding the reference point of the other side. How do they think? Why do they think like that? How do you adjust their thought process to suit your own conditions? It's got to be our responsibility. So let me say this. I remember many years ago, uh, Condoleezza Rice, the former Secretary of State, she used to say something that really um, touched me. She said, you know, if China wanted to be the global leader, let China, because unless China becomes one, China doesn't really know the responsibility it takes to be a global leader. And I think very much so when it comes to China-Africa relationships, China talks about win-win. And I think uh, like uh, what Professor Chen has referred to, I think China is yet to step up on the soft power understanding of its position to match its economic position in the world today. And so China goes out and talks to African countries about win-win. China is a big power. African countries are relatively smaller powers. If I talk with you, Dr. Moyo, about win-win, do you treat me as a friend? Do you really trust me? Do you trust me, Professor Chen? <laughs> you see, my, my starting point is very simple. I, uh, I expect you to act on the basis of what you know. What you know and what your interests are, and I think that is legitimate. There is nothing wrong with it. I say, from the other side, it is my responsibility to have knowledge of what I want and framework of how I'm going to do it and in the engagement, just like we've said, if your peer has demonstrated this and done it well, all the other African countries, if they are interested, ought to go and engage with Ethiopia and see how come it has worked. This engagement with China has worked in Ethiopia. It's because Ethiopia never sure. made the mistake of saying China is going to come and tell us what to do. Ethiopians have always been clear. We'll go and ask for assistance if it's assistance or ask for resources where we can get them but ethiopia belongs to us and it is our responsibility to know what to do what's how to sequence it and why we want to do it that way then when they explain themselves if you say we don't see it the same way ethiopians have always been they say it's okay it's your money 
and therefore it's your right to say so, we'll go and get the money somewhere else. Mm -hmm. I mean, how responsible is that? That's the way it should be. Mm -hmm. yeah, I completely agree with that, but many African governments are very timid about trying to do something like that. I think the Europe Ethiopians are, in fact, very, very bold and very unique uh, in being able to step up and really demanding that negotiations be conducted between equals, because that's really the stance they're taking. Treat us an, as an equal partner in these discussions and these negotiations. And the number of delegations that have come out of Africa to China very often still don't include fully functional, as it were, African translators of Chinese to English or Chinese uh, to French. It's gotten a lot better of late. But you've got to have that kind of capacity because, of course, as all, as, all of us around this uh, uh, you know, broadcast podcast uh, know, uh, the detail, the devil is in the detail and in the small talk in between the main negotiating sessions. If you can't participate in those, well, you're dead in the water for starters. So upgrading capacity has got, again, as I said before, all kinds of nuances attached to it. And it's basically dealing with those nuances. But just to return to a point that Nkosana was making, uh, what you've got in terms of the Chinese government and its party, or the party and its government, uh, basically trying to see the world in its own image and dealing with it as if the world were a mirror of its own image, that's reflected in the way that embassies, Chinese embassies, conduct political reportage and economic reportage in the countries where they are based. They're mandated to talk to the government. They're not mandated to talk to the opposition, uh, for instance. So in 2008, when in a fair election, Morgan Changarai should have been the winner of the presidential elections in Zimbabwe, and I was there for that, all my polling had him held 56%. He was a clear victor in those elections. And Kusada is very familiar with those elections. Yeah, uh, absolutely. But... Um, the Chinese at that point in time, uh, when even their polling suggested that Morgan Changarai was going to be the rightful winner before it was stolen from him, had no file, no file on Changarai to send to Beijing because they had not been mandated to look at the opposition. It didn't occur to them that the opposition might win a victory. Their commitment was to Robert Mugabe and to this particular party. That's changed a little bit so that in Zambia they did have a file on Hichilema, uh, the new uh, Zambian uh, president who won decisively their recent elections. But you've got this whole history, this whole backlog of naivety that the world must be as China sees it. And there's one other factor which I would like to introduce as well. And that's to do with a certain uh, almost unconscious uh, value uh, as it were, approach to what the Chinese are doing. It's part of a self-justification, but it's also something that they truly believe in. Just as the Americans truly believe in spreading the word of democracy, et cetera, et cetera. And that is, there's still a very, con basically, uh, difficult to describe, but residual Confucianism in the way the Chinese think about the outside world and their obligation to the outside world. The idea of reciprocity, that you have an obligation to those that you're helping, while at the same time you're looting their resources, for, to use a vulgar term, but you still have to give something back, and a lot back, particularly up front. Uh, so you've got this Confucian reciprocity, which is vertical, it's hierarchical, it's not flatline and egalitarian, like a Western view of political ethics. Uh, but because it's hierarchical, uh, the big brother at the top must look after the younger brother even if the younger brother owes big brother all kinds of things. But this means that you're treating African countries frequently with an unconscious bias that they're the younger brother. And this actually takes equality out of negotiations. Now, that's why the Ethiopians have been so good in demanding equality, and the Angolans to a certain extent as well. But it's hard for the rest of the world to follow this because, of course, you've got Portuguese as the language of government in Angola, and we're bad enough with Chinese as learned Portuguese as well. But demanding to be treated as an equal in the face of an unconscious Confucian hierarchical view of the world, and also in the face of what Nkosana so ably pointed out, that the world is seen in modern terms as a replica of Chinese governing structures. When you've got those twin biases built into the foundation of the Chinese vision, 
Well, very, very often you're going to have a great difficulty in recognizing the possibility and the desirability of equality in negotiation. Add to that naivety and lack of preparedness and a distinction between technocratic thought and political drivers in many African governments, then you've got almost sometimes the recipe for a perfect storm. But as Nkasana was saying, this is not because the Chinese are being wicked. They're being a victim of circumstances in terms of their own formation, as much as the Africans might be a victim of circumstances in their formation today. So this whole thing has got much more delicacy to it than many, I think, casual commentators would be prepared to admit. Can I just add a slightly different way of, uh, of looking at this? Often I say to people, we cannot have a conversation about Africa, the Africa-China axis without triangulation. What, and what do I mean by that? China has got very strong relationship with the Western world because that's really the, the counter, isn't it? This debate only arises because we are comparing the Western world and the, the Eastern world to some extent and then Africa. So let's triangulate. China deals with the US, with Europe. China deals with Africa. Europe and the West deal with Africa. Let's compare how these three axes work. So the evidence on the ground is that the Chinese and the West can deal with each other. In spite of having very different systems, okay, they deal with each other. There are many Western businesses in, uh, in, in China, and China is present and trades with the whole world. The Western world has had a very long-lasting relationship with Africa, and a lot of the damage that has happened on the African continent is not because of China. It's been because of the relationship with the Western world. Now, when you look at the amount of capital that is sloshed between these geographies, in fact, what is coming onto the African continent is dwarfed by the amount of money that are moving between China and the Western world. So exactly what is the conversation? China is an appropriate partner for the Western world, trade partner, business partner, political partner. They've got embassies everywhere for the Western world, but not for Africa, really. You, you begin to see that the logic that is being used to debate this is flawed. Because the, West, the reason why the Western world and the China relationship works is because there is an acceptance that each side is responsible for the outcomes for themselves. China is not going to go to the West to, look, to try and be nice and make the West, Western world benefit to the detriment of China or vice versa. There is that understanding assumed already. So why aren't we asking of Africa the same thing? So we hear uh, just a quick question for you, uh, Professor Chen. Um, from uh, what uh, Dr. Moyu said, obviously, uh, pragmatism is a, is a very practical way of uh, chi China's uh, political philosophy towards the world as well. So there is uh, no perpetual friends, only eternal interest, I guess it really stands in the context. However, I was in uh, Spain uh, for the past uh, six weeks teaching. And in looking at uh, the old uh, Spanish empire, it just really brings to mind this uh, historical understanding of cycles. Well, that's go away and global powers fade. And at one point in time, you know, now it's all good. China is uh, investing tremendously in Africa and bringing economic prosperity to Africa in a profound way as well. However, um, with this sort of a transactional relationship, you know, it's a win-win. Um, everybody's built on this uh, understanding of economic prosperity. When one day, when the music chair, when the money stops, then what happens? Well, it's a big question. What happens when the money stops with any one of us? But things can change quite rapidly, uh, and the worm can turn. Uh, to use uh, an old Western phrase, and this almost happened in two thousand and eight with the Western banking crisis. And one of the national casualties or likely casualties of this was Portugal. Portugal as a nation state was on the verge of going bankrupt. At that stage, curiously, the Angolans, having been a Portuguese colony, and I'm sure they did this with a lot of schadenfreude and emotional satisfaction, and they're also being cheeky, but they really could have done it. They said, we'll bail you out. We've got the capacity to save your economy. And they did have the capacity to save the Portuguese economy. 
they didn't have to at the end because finally the West sorted out its own banking crisis. Uh, but it shows that things are not set in some kind of perpetual logic or a perpetual predetermined for all time way of doing things. Uh, so it would be interesting to see how Africa does develop. This won't happen immediately, obviously, but there are signs that some African countries are going to become extremely able in terms of how they deal with the outside world. If I could just pick up on Kasana's point about uh, comparing China with the United States, uh, for instance, I was part of what was grandly called a trilateral dialogue in Washington, D.C. once again on the side of the African delegation. The trilateral participants were China, an African delegation uh, which was brought largely from both the African Union, um, uh, the Secretariat of the African Union, and um, uh, African ministers from different parts, China, Africa in that sense, and the Americans. And the Americans were just as blatantly disregarding of the African ambitions as the Chinese were. Uh, it was quite horrifying, in fact. And the African delegation one night just locked itself away, literally locked itself away. Uh, and we sat down and wrote a, a declaration about how we would like both sides to treat African aspirations. Because they were both as guilty as the other while calling each other names, of course. You know, you're more dirty than us. You're more wicked than us. But both were absolutely condescending to quite a high-powered African delegation. It was led by the deputy chair of the African Union. You know, that's pretty, pretty senior uh, in African terms. And everyone around the table, not just an advisor like me, we were just completely disgusted by the condescension from both sides. So the point is, yes, sometimes the Chinese make big mistakes in their assumptions and their condescension, etc. So does the West. And as Nkosana was saying, it's we in the West who've done historical damage far more than what the Chinese have managed to do. And so we need to look to ourselves. In fact, what you're looking at in terms of each side calling the other dirtier than they, you're looking at a common historical phenomenon where the outside world as a whole has condescended uh, towards Africa. It's that which needs to change. And then Africa can develop relations of its own choosing, of its own type, with all parts of the world, not just with China. And again, if I may, so I can say so as an African here. You know, I think the sad truth is that respect is not something you demand. Respect is something you earn through what you do and how you do what you do. I often say, sadly, the world today, because of co political correctness, so you get a seat at the UN, you get a seat uh, represented at the World Bank, at the IMF and the like. But do you really have a voice? By being present physically, it does not mean you've got a voice. Until you bring quality to the conversations that take place, you don't have a voice. You are present, yes, because you are being human. And this is not the, is something that either China or the West can correct for us. It's up to us to correct it. And we, we can only do it once we understand capacity and merit matter. The quality of what you do and how you do it matter. And that's the only way there's never been an exception. In, in fact, if I may put it very bluntly, the Chinese and the West don't like each other. In fact, there is lots of denigration that goes on between the two of them. But do the Chinese, I was going to use French, excuse me, do they care? The answer is no, they don't care. Why don't they care? Because they can run their country properly. That's why they don't care. And the Africa needs to wake up and understand that. If I could um, come in very quickly on behalf of our students, I mean, um, I mean, there is also the question of a, a friend or foe for who exactly. I mean, a closer relationship with China may be advantageous for authoritarian states or those with authoritarian aspirations, but not for democracies. So it's a question of how attractive the Beijing model of governance is um, for different states, depending on where they are, with big state intervention and centralized political control. But particularly for our students, they're interested in the C word, which is colonialism. 
And so to be as provocative as the, the, the title of the session, I suppose, is, I mean, central to questions of African development have been questions of to what extent development itself is an enduring form of colonialism. For better, for worse, the same Western countries of empire are heavily involved in reshaping the economies today, leading humanitarian missions, um, helping out with conflicts, etc. So as China has some expansionist agenda, at least on the surface, whether that is overplayed or not, in the Ch South China Sea, for example, does the colonialism question hold water in this context, even if it's non-military and only economic? So if I may, Lawrence, if, can I call you Lawrence? Is that OK? So uh, my question, I, would tend your, I think your question is absolutely valid, and your students are right, are right to ask those questions. So first question is, what has Africa learned from its history of being colonized? What is the evidence today that we've actually extracted value from the journey traveled that we are now applying to avoid any repeats? And the second question I would ask your students is, who is colonizing Africa? Is it China or Africans inviting China to colonize them? Agency again, where are you putting the responsibility? Do Chinese issue themselves passport African visas and residence permits and so on and so on. No, they don't. We do it. Yes. If, if, if we keep pointing fingers at over there rather than examining what we are doing wrong, we will never solve this. The minute we take responsibility and introspect about what we do and why we do it, things we shouldn't continue doing, we are not going to solve the problem. It is our responsibility. No, I agree absolutely with that. And the very use of the term colonialism tends to be very, very lazy. It assumes that Africa is just open for being colonized again, as if the African subject had no agency to resist or negotiate or fight back against this. It's really a recycling under these progressive colors of the most lazy colonial trope that you can walk into Africa and do what you like. So although I also understand why the students say that, uh, and you know, I'm from somewhere, as I can say this to other C students, you have to complicate your analysis a little bit. The world is not quite as straightforward that simply it can be diagnosed just like that with a single sort of word drawn from the past. Relationships are very, very complicated and they need to be treated as very, very complicated. And, what Nkosana was saying, the future lies in Africa and everyone else for that matter, developing its own agency. But to assume that there's an insufficiency of agency and to use words like a rerun of colonialism, that's not the way to appreciate a very, very complex and emerging continent. And emerging means what it says. That word at least is a real word. There's so much progress being made, very problematically, under these very, very complicated and complex and contradictory colors, but there's an awful lot of, let us say, Afro-optimism that is possible alongside the obvious Afro-pessimism, which you just can't wish away, but you've got a picture emerging of a dynamic continent and not one just open, prostrate on the ground for the penetration of a new colonialism. I mean, one example, I think, again, we, we, we write lots of plans and pieces of paper and what have you. But you know, the economic integration of Africa is such an obvious thing to do. This should have happened years ago. And you, as an African, you have to ask yourself, what is it that is all? Why don't we realize that without an integrated African economy, we are not going anywhere? The world, the way the world works is through contestation. Even if you look again, I use examples of Europe and the US. These are the same people. They are forever taking each other to court to the World Trade Organization on trade issues and so on. Contestation right through and through. So we need to understand that everybody has got the legitimacy of looking after their interests. And it is up to us to strengthen ourselves. And we talk about Africa. Africa is comparable to India in terms of size of population. The economy is kind, not, not in the same, but 
if we combine, we created an African economy, not 54 economies, would begin to have economies of scale, which would allow us both, in fact, to attract investments much more easily, because if an investor says, I come and invest in little Malawi, but I've got the whole continent as a market without hindrance and so on and so on, capital is going to come in. Why don't we see these things? Why don't we understand them? Who is to blame other than us? Who is to blame? So it's we us. do hear a very strong we do hear a very strong sense of the rights of that African continental identity. And in a way, it's uh, similar, I guess, uh, to the rights of uh, nationalism that we see in China and even uh, today very much uh, so in the United States. But uh, with that sense of uh, that ownership of, of our Africa by the African leaders, it, So this morning, talking about uh, all these uh, documents. Sorry, Shell, I lost. You. So this morning, talking about all. Uh, I'm back now. Yeah. So this morning, talk, this morning, talking about uh, the African aspirations, we did hear a lot of uh, aspirations for Africa and very ambitious aspirations, including from you, Dr. Moi. We heard this morning from the African Development Bank that uh, Africa wants to catch up from a low income status to a middle to a high income status like China within one generation. Africa wants to lead the fourth wave of industrial revolutions. And uh, this morning, Hannah on your panel, she talked about Africa as a continent will become the world's third largest economy. And I think that will happen. It's just a matter of time. So but then let, let's think let, about let, it. Let we have to question. Now. I'm going to ask a question which I'm not going to answer, uh, but I'll put it out there. Of the oh, African sure leaders, it, Professor Chair. <laughs> okay. Of the African leaders at head of state level, as of today, how many do you think have got a clue of what we're talking about and what to do about it? Just I leave that. I I think there are a few, but not many. So. The, the, the technocrats can write all the papers they like. The implementation is going to come from political will. Mm -hmm. And as Professor Chan indicated, in the case of uh, President Lungu and uh, Margaret Manakato, who I know very well, mm -hmm. these contradictions where the, the capacity is there at lower level, the technical ability is there. In fact, we educate people and export them because we don't want to use them. Because we'd prefer to give jobs to people who don't know anything that they're doing because of patronage. Look at, you know, the concept, for instance, of privatization or no privatization. It's got nothing to do with ideology, in my opinion. You can run public sector institutions quite competently, provided you man them with competent people. But what do we do? We use the fact that these are public sector institutions to put our relatives in charge of them. Relatives who know nothing about how to run them. And then you can look, again, look at the evidence right across the continent. Look at all the public sector institutions and what has become of them. How did we get there? If well, you go to Europe, the there are certain the public sector institutions like railways, which up to today, running efficiently, so it's not private public sector which is the issue. It's understanding you need competence to run these things. Give the right people the jobs to run them. It's like when you go to the doctor, you want to be operated by your cousin who doesn't, who has never been to medical school. Really? You don't do that. So why do you do it with these things? I must give uh, Professor Chan some fair air time here. So uh, just to follow up on what uh, Nosana just talked about. So let's say uh, Africa gets there with AFCFTA, becomes the world's large, um, you know, third largest economy, according to Hannah, by the midpoint of uh, the century. And China will be the world's largest economy. And possibly Africa will be China's largest investment market. And then you are looking at uh, possibly with our RCEP, with ASEAN, then China, ASEAN, and Africa integration is solidly there. And China is all in on ASEAN and Africa. What opportunities uh, is there still left for the West? 
Well, I think this is something the West has got to face up to, that they could only be one player among many players of huge capacity, economic capacity, and huge sophistication. And I really do hope that Africa is one of those new players, and it's got every possibility of being so, if it gets its act together along the lines that Nkosana was talking about. But again, as Nkosana was saying, it's got to overcome many problems. My own favorite example of giving, as it were, a very complicated job to someone who's close to you, but in a, a slightly different way than mere family, uh, was Jacob Zuma and the chief executive of South African Airways. Uh, the relationship there is quite well known, uh, the stuff of gossip, but how not to run an airline, how to ruin an airline, uh, emerging from bankruptcy now, having lost 40, 40 of its 46 planes. Uh, and really, it's almost a prime example of how not to do something. Whereas again, if I can label my example of the Ethiopians, Ethiopian Airways is the perfect example of how to run a professional airline. You run it professionally. So if Africa can integrate its economies far more, and if it can appoint technocratic people without political interference into strategic sectors, yes, it can be one of the great players along China, alongside ASEAN, uh, you know, basically, and I still have some hope for the future of Europe as a bloc player, although uh, it seems to be going out of its way to disappoint me at this moment in time. Uh, all of these things are possible, but it won't just be the West as represented by the United States of America. It's going to be a much more complex array of players of differing, but at the same time, at the end of the day, something like equal throw weight, but arrived at in different ways. So that the bipolar world that we see now, just America and China, isn't going to be the case in the future. And of course, it's my hope, it's Hassan's hope, it's all of our hope that Africa will be up there as one of the big players. But it does have to make some great internal steps forward along the lines of what we've been discussing in this debate or discussion uh, today. It can do that. If the new generation of technocratically capable people replace the dead weight, and I do refer to them as dead weight of old presidents who know nothing about the world and its complexities, if there could be that kind of sea change in terms of leadership, then there's everything to play for, for a, a very, very different future. In fact, Steve, the, the base is so low that great strides can be made so quickly you would be amazed. It's, it's not complicated. Africa is endowed with, in terms of resources, unimaginable in relative terms. And even human resources, which we just choose not to use. So the hurdle is so low, the opportunity is so big, the resource base is so big that we, it would be, I mean, would make wonders very, very quickly. And I hope that, uh, Lawrence, you can give your students some of this advice that they need to take responsibility. <laughs> I was going to say, uh, it, it's, uh, it's truly lucky and fortunate that China has been having the right to kind of leadership that brought China to this uh, economic miracle. Uh, we only need uh, 55 times of that sort of right leadership in Africa, which is very easy. <laughs> it's, uh, we, we've got, uh, we've got uh, I can see the, um, the, uh, the work that we need to do ahead. Sorry, Lawrence, go ahead. Well, we have another question coming um, from uh, Tapi Wagomo, who asks um, for Dr. Moyo to comment on Rwanda. So why is Rwanda doing better than other African leaders? And how does that fit within the scope of China's role in Africa? I suppose the question is asking what lessons could be learned, perhaps. The lesson is, it's again, President Kagame. You know, firstly, let me maybe give you a bit of history, which I happen to have an insight on because I was, I had the, the privilege of being able to access President Kagame when I was at the ADB. And the President Kagame was very close to uh, Prime Minister Meles. They were counterparts when, before Meles died. And they used to have very close conversations about what to do. So don't be surprised that we are talking on the one hand about what happens in Ethiopia and what the Ethiopians have done and what Kagame is doing because 
they were of very similar minds in terms of taking ownership of what they were going to do with their country. You know, whoever is asking the question, I hope they are aware of the Gachacha issue. Remember, after the genocide, the Western world wanted the, the people who were perpetrators of this crime to be tried in The Hague, and Kagame said, no, we are going to use our, i.e., what am I illustrating? Ownership, agency. He said, no, I know my own community, I know my country, I know my society, and the appropriate solution is we are going to use our own traditional uh, legal systems to deal with this issue. And that's what he did. He had the confidence, but what you can see in terms of what Kagame has done is that above all else, he's got the interests of his country and his people. And he believes in getting competent people to run things. I don't know whether you've been to Kigali. If you have not been, you should go and see how Rwanda as a country, what it has managed to achieve in the last 20 years post, uh, post the genocide. Amazing stuff, and it's illustrative of what all the other African countries could achieve. So it's just political will, respect for merit, meritocracy, and the clarity in terms of agency and not trying to give that responsibility to somebody else. I think those are the things that are required. I think one other thing too, which fits into the theme of our discussion, a respect for technocracy. So if you were to ask Kagame's people, what's his external role model? He's going to say Singapore. Absolutely. Another country that has developed, a small country like Rwanda, has developed because of technical skill. And there's been no bones made about that. Singapore set out to do that. Kagame wanted to use that as his role model. He wanted Kigali to be the wired up capital of East Africa along Singaporean lines. Now, it takes an awful lot of educated skill to even appreciate that you can use the example of Singapore. It's looking east, but in a different way, uh, to almost a paradigm of what could happen in Asia as a whole, to benefit China, for instance, if it wants to look at the Singaporean model of the blend between public and private sector, uh, letting some liberties go forth on a commercial basis. So Kagame, uh, you know, has the wisdom, the foresight, and I do absolutely credit his discussions with uh, Malaysia Nawi. Uh, you know, these were two men of very rare foresight. And if they were helping out each other, and if they were looking east to an unusual part of the east, that is Singapore, not looking to Beijing or Shanghai, that shows real perception as well as imagination. So all of those things that you mentioned, but also an appreciation of the absolute indispensability of having a technocratic future. Uh, the world is different now to the world of liberation. You can't have an imagination of the past. And if your imagination of the future can't understand these complex things, then to put it point blank, you have got no right to be president of your country anymore. Agreed. Agreed. Mm. That, that is indeed so interesting. So, uh, Professor Chen and actually uh, Nosana Chu, you both are actually talking about the ex uh, Africa's uh, uh, exploration of a hybrid, almost a hybrid kind of technocratic uh, governance model that is neither East nor West. So, essentially, um, this morning somebody was talking about, uh, oh, yeah, actually, uh, in the opening session, uh, we were talking about uh, uh, Africa adopting the uh, state uh, industrial policies in Africa in terms of promoting technological diffusion. And I just thought mm, that's something very innovative. Is that appropriate in the African continent within the uh, broader context? Do you think uh, Africa will essentially adopt an industrial policy model? I see no reason why not. I mean, private entrepreneurs, in fact, these are from the informal sector in Nigeria, uh, developed um, a tablet, a uh, laptop tablet uh, that could be manufactured with the same capacity uh, as a, a Western or a Huawei tablet uh, for 10 US dollars. The Indians have done the same. Now, just think about what this can do. Uh, we're all still busily sending used school books and university textbooks by the cargo load to African universities and to African schools. That's so old fashioned on our part. 
if we said tablets where one child can access several thousand books and have them manufactured for ten dollars each using African expertise, supporting African startups to do exactly that, you would cut through the education gap like a knife cuts through butter. So it's imagination and a supporting local entrepreneurs who've got the skills to do this. So yes, of course, Africa should industrialize. And by that, I mean a generation jump in an industry. It doesn't have to be heavy polluting industry. You can go straight to the technological electronic stuff. And if you say they can't do that, they bloody well can do that. Yeah. Trust yeah. people, invest in the startups, trust the young people. They can work it out. This amazing skill that is just untapped by patronage societies that are also technologically illiterate. Once you cut through that, the future is bright, but it means entrusting technology, technocratic skills, and above all, the younger generation. Let the younger generation have its head, young men and young women, and what you're going to have is the kind of revolution that Nkosano has been dreaming of and which I certainly hope for. In fact, uh, 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 Steve, your, your point is so, so important. In the morning, there was a conversation about uh, the environmental issues and moving away from fossil fuels into renewable energy. And what I pointed out is that that's, these are situations where, in fact, underdevelopment is an asset. It's an asset because you don't have baggage, which is quite costly to to convert in order for you to make the transition. It's almost like you're starting from scratch anyway. There is nothing to lose. <laughs> so you, 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 you can cast off the light vest you are wearing because you don't have a shirt and a jacket, and you know what I mean? And move on very quickly. And it's just a mindset issue. We need to understand this is where it could be a huge advantage. We don't have this weighing us down in terms of the cost of jettisoning what we already have because it's very little. Mm -hmm. And one last question, uh, perhaps a sensitive one. In uh, recent months, uh, there was a terrorist attack in Pakistan of nine Chinese engineers in a in a bus attack, as a matter of fact. And so right afterwards, uh, China's uh, party newspaper, Global Times, they came up with an op-ed in which it says that uh, China wouldn't mind sending special operational forces into Pakistan to help eradicate terrorism. And so honestly, this would be my first experience in hearing that China is actually willing to deploy special forces uh, in, uh, uh, beyond its border to essentially protect its overseas interests, either human or, or assets. So with massive amount of investment interests growing in Africa and beyond, do you foresee in the coming decades that there will be an increasing military presence or security presence from China on the African continent? This is a very tough one and a very sensitive one, of course. Uh, if there is going to be such a thing, they better upgrade the capacity of their soldiers. I've seen Chinese peacekeeping soldiers in African jurisdictions who I would regard as completely hopeless. They don't know what they're doing. They've got no command structure that is viable for the task at hand. Uh, their job is just to sit there and be symbolic and let other peacekeeping forces do all the heavy lifting. Uh, and African forces are quite good at peacekeeping. They could quite do without any kind of interference from well-meaning outside of forces. Uh, in terms of special units to guard sensitive installations. Well, the Americans have been doing this for quite some time, but disguising it underneath private contractor arrangements. That's not part of the Chinese model, but I would advise very strongly against any kind of direct Chinese military official presence. It sends all the wrong signals and it discourages, in this case, the Pakistanis from dealing with dissent and dissatisfaction in their own country. The Belt and the Road initiative, insofar as the overland route, the physical overland route and the maritime route were going to be joined up, had to go through Pakistan. The three Chinese uh, railheads to go from Pakistan, to go from China through Pakistan, one of them went through Baluchistan, the most troubled part of Pakistan with an insurgency problem right on the border with Afghanistan. So there was cross-border feet there. 
none of the Chinese planning documents seem to recognize that this would be problematic. And so now to say, because we had no political intelligence, because we were naive and stupid about this, therefore let's send in special forces, that's very rich. It shows naivety on the Chinese part as well. And it's not going to be cleaned up by sending in special forces who may have no sensitivity to the needs of the local population, not understand the real causes of the Baluchistani insurgency, uh, have no understanding of the cross-border traffic between Baluchistan and Afghanistan, or deals with central Taliban leaderships notwithstanding, which the Chinese try to forge right now. That is a hugely difficult environment. And trying to send in commando forces, aggressive as it were peacemaking forces to parts of Africa, you're asking for trouble. You know, you've got to understand the local situation. And if you're going to do it, you'd better send in damn sight higher caliber soldiers than what the Chinese have done so far in African peacekeeping missions. I agree with that. I, I second Thank that. And I think, that firstly, firstly, I think the issue of peace is a global issue, not a Pakistani, Chinese, or whatever. I think we've learned less. We should have learned lessons from the past. That peace is a global issue. Therefore, the structure of intervention, I think, ought to take guidance from that that observation. So, if you're dealing with a situation which is an in-country situation, I think the best way is to support the local resources for them to be at the front of that intervention. If it's a regional issue, again, use a, in the first instance, regional resources, support those to deliver that, as Professor Chan says, they understand the environment, they understand the societies, and it's the best way to do it. And then if we escalate beyond that, we have to try harder, in my opinion, to find ways of using the UN and make it a real functional thing. We need to understand a much more nuanced global approach to achieve global peace and then not say China is going out of its territory to protect its interests. I think that's looking for trouble. Well, with that, uh, we uh, would love to Thank both gentlemen, uh, Professor Stephen Chen, Foundation Dean of uh, SOAS uh, University of London, and uh, uh, Professor Chair, Professor of World Politics, Dr. Nosana Moyu, politician and economist from Zimbabwe. We thank you so much for your insightful views on China's uh, future role in the African continent. And I would like to thank all our audience who have been with us all day. Please uh, do continue to stay with us, send your, uh, your comments, uh, your questions, and we'll continue to deliver high quality China Africa programs with our uh, global talents uh, uh, and, uh, and expertise all over the world. And I would like to thank uh, uh, Lawrence for staying on with me and thank uh, particularly our colleagues who are not on the live stream, but they have been with us in the studio all day long. I would really love to thank all our uh, colleagues at the Faroj Logi Center of uh, Africa at the London School of Economics. And so please uh, stay connected with us. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Thank you.